Good day, everyone. Welcome to Critical Faculty Podcast. Uh, today uh, is a special day. Uh, today in Australia, we're the 12th already, Sunday the 12th, it's Darwin Day. And um, I've got just the right celebration for you, celebrating the idea that's changed the world forever, in my opinion. And uh, the panel uh, to explain all the difficult questions you might have or all the suspicions you might have about uh, the theory of evolution via uh, natural selection. Uh, please join me in welcoming Erica. Hello, Erica. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Very good. Hello, Aram. How you do? Very good. Thank you. Today, Dave. Hi, how's it going? Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, I really cannot hide my excitement. This is a very special day and <laughs> it's a great celebration for, and I think probably we, we ought to spend a few minutes uh, commemorating the man who's made this podcast maybe possible, uh, Charles Darwin. And I'd like you all to, to chip in and, and say, what do you think of this man and his simple idea that has changed the world forever, starting with Erica? Oh, man. I mean, where do you start, right? Like, it's the, the theory of evolution and, and indeed all that ties into it and has tied into it as we've continued to discover more um, in the past century and a half is it's the foundation of all that we understand of biology, like from the ground up, absolutely nothing works without it. And in, in that way, he's, he's sort of the father of the entire field. Isn't he? I mean, naturalism um, as sort of a, a field of work by people who are being naturalists, right, has been done by humans since the dawn of time, since we were capable of observing the world around us. But Darwin contextualized it in, in such an elegant way that, you know, when when Origin came out, right, people were like, duh, right? That, that, was, that was the general reaction to the scientific community, right? It was, wait, okay, of course, right? Which is, I think, I think about as important as it sounds, which is to say very. Fantastic. Uh, Aaron, um, what do you reckon of the man, great man? Well, here's the thing. It, 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 uh, Careless Linnaeus in 1735, uh, this is the most important argument that I can think of. Careless Linnaeus, when he constructed his, his uh, systematic classification of life, he realized that these did not, that the animal species that he was looking at were not simply species. They weren't just like created kinds because each one was nested in a parent category, which was itself nested in a further parent category, and that all of these were interconnected like a family tree of life. And he couldn't make sense of that. That would require, his system required that speciation must happen, which he, in the 1700s, thought that a species could only come about through a special act of creation by God. Certainly, you can have variation within a species, but to produce a new species, he thought initially, had to be a divine action. And it was a century later that Charles Darwin says, well, no, he explained the origin of species by means of natural selection. So Charles Darwin showed that there is a mechanism by which new species can come about. And since we've discovered multiple mechanisms by which species could come about. I, don't, I wasn't talking to you, Siri. Shut the fuck up and stay out of my conversation. Anyway, uh, so uh, when, when Darwin came up with the, with the origin of species, that sort of solved uh, Linnaeus' dilemma. And creationists at the time were always arguing that we've never seen a new species evolve. And even when I was a child, where people were still saying, we've never seen a new species evolve. Except that now, uh, even the leaders of evangelical ministries like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham admit that speciation is directly observed and documented. So, so often and so, and so definitely that they can't even argue against it anymore. So what they've done is they've moved the goalposts mm -hmm. to say that macroevolution is no longer the variation of news or the emergence of new species, that it must be some undefined higher level. But we know that the word was never defined as anything other than changes at or above the species level, which means that speciation is part of macroevolution. And so everybody that wants to argue that it's the genus level or the family level, or in Ken Ham's case, where they want to say that it's it can even be the level of a taxonomic order if necessary, just to avoid having to admit when something you know is evolved that you don't that you're not comfortable with evolve, admitting evolving, that they have to change that they they know what they're doing is deliberately deceptive. But it's all about make believe. They, they have to believe in a fairy tale 
but they have to believe it. And they'll make up any that they can to do that. You've never seen a whale, a whale turn into a pine tree. That's pretty much what that is. Uh, probably we should maybe take a moment of silence for Kent Hovind's YouTube career. I'm sure you've gotten that news, right? <laughs> catch, catch me up, Dave. What happened? Oh, he's up. gone. He, they deleted his uh, YouTube channels. He's no longer oh. Well, so, what, what, what he did immediately after that was so once he discovered that was he made an announcement on another channel that he was going to move everything to his uh, his DAL d dinosaur yeah. and then they deleted that know, one. Adventureland whatever d d fucking amusement park fraudulent scheme whatever they what called a tool. it and then that it, was immediately canceled as well. Was it on the back of uh, spreading misinformation? Yeah, misinformation. Yeah. Well, no, 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 it's not <laughs> more complicated. <laughs> than that. It was the apricot smooth, wasn't it? Right, Har harboring the pedophile or something like that. I, I, I don't know the details, but it's obviously oh, wow. a lot more nefarious yeah, than yeah. it's not just misinformation. Otherwise, a lot more people would have their YouTube channels. Uh, That's revoked. true. Yeah, because so the game more had that, that article. They had the hit piece that came out, and then uh -huh. had that, yeah. Like, there's some criminal activity. I, I don't know. I, I haven't looked into it, but obviously, you wow. know, he's dealing with all kinds of all kinds of criminal stuff. I love the way that you describe Kent Hovind as saying there's some criminal activity. Yeah. <laughs> they got him on something. I don't know what it was. I emailed my partner manager. I was like, Dean, I don't know who was in charge of the decision to get rid of Kent Hovind's channels, but uh, g g tell that guy <laughs> I owe him a beer. <laughs> and I'm a fruit basket. Yeah. Well, I, I want to start from the very beginning. Do, do you guys like me think that physics? Chemistry, biochemistry, biology is a sequence of events. And, and do you think there are some connections among all these factors? So we start with physics and the, the creation of the, well, the, the emergence of the universe. Um, and, and, and then uh, for everything to be glued together, you need chemistry and then emerges well, biochemistry and then biology. Would that be the right sequence? If, if, if I may, I'd like to jump into this one first. I mean, Dave probably has a better answer than I do. But this is the most irritating thing for me when I talk to creationists and they realize, okay, well, you you definitely know evolution, so let's talk about anything else. Uh, let's talk about cre you know, the origin of the universe. And all I can say to that is I don't know cosmology, but I've, I've spoken to a number of cosmogonists like you know, right. Sean Carroll and, and uh, Lawrence Krauss. By the way, Lawrence Krauss does not believe that the universe came from nothing. I know that he wrote a book with that title, but it was just the title. Mm -hmm. You have to read past that <laughs> to realize that that's not actually what he was saying. And so cosmologists commonly say that even in models of cosmogony where there is a, uh, a singularity, which is not constant. I mean, there's, there are other models in which there's not one. But in the models that have a singularity, that singularity is still considered to be eternal. It didn't come from nowhere. So the, the near constant assault that I hear from creation. Well, you believe everything came from nothing. No, that's you guys. You believe that in creation ex nihilo. We don't. We believe in the first law of thermodynamics that, that, that material energy is eternal, was never created. You're the ones that think that God said abracadabra and poof out of nothing, not us. Yeah. The, the reason, I just want to give this a background. The reason I'm bringing this up is uh, I'm trying to say that life isn't uh, if, if life is fundamental, uh, then why it is not at the beginning? Uh, Clearly, it, it, life it, is not so, fundamental. Yeah, it, it doesn't look good that way because it, we wait. We have to wait for quite some time. I think up to what three point seven, three point eight billion years uh, from this point, about seven hundred million years after our uh, Earth has emerged. Yeah. And um, obviously, the, the the temperature did not allow for life. And maybe uh, Dave can add. Uh, some interest in chemistry here because I think chemistry was was a play before all of that happened. Well, yeah, obviously, I mean, the the chronologically, what you said has to be true, right? The things that life are made of, uh, namely molecules, are made possible due to laws of chemistry, which require the existence of atoms, which are described by physics. Uh, so, yeah, that's that that must be true. Um, yeah, I don't know. We we went in a few different different directions all really quickly. <laughs> which way do we want to go here? I so if, if life isn't fundamental and it's an emerging property, it's something that emerges. Yeah. Um, and then it's, I think Edwin Schrodinger, who's a physicist, wrote a book called What is Life? And I love his um, interpretation of what life is. It's, it's, it's a, a challenge against entropy. It's a cell that closes on itself to sustain itself, 
to, to keep the information for as long as it can. Um, and, and that's the, the start of, of life. And, um, uh, and uh, reproduction here is going to be a key word because the reproduction at that time happens to be identical. It's splitting. Uh, and then we end up um, uh, evolving that mechanism to uh, sexual reproduction uh, that is going to cause all these sort of conversations we're about to have, natural selection, uh, adaptability, and all the mechanics of, of evolution. Mm -hmm. Do you a, think, a, again, a, yeah, go ahead. A key, a key point, though, just to jump in, though, is uh, some of the papers that I've read, which I can't really recall the details off the top of my head, but more and more what I saw in reading those papers is that this myth of going against entropy is actually not true. It's actually entropy that prompted the, the generation of these structures as a way of dissipating uh, these flows of free energy, namely sunlight. Uh, so I, in, in some of the content I made on James Tour, I highlighted some papers, uh, namely from Eigen and then a few other people. This is actually earlier stuff in the 70s and 80s. They're describing life as a manifestation of the second law of thermodynamics. So sp specifically being prompted by entropy. Uh, so it's, it's not it's not in opposition to entropy. So it's just another layer. Anytime you hear, you know, somebody, oh, you know, entropy, you can't make order. So life violates you know i don't even know what the hell they say these days but um it's idiotic right life is specifically prompted by by entropy so yeah very interesting erica you got anything to say to that i mean how yeah how, how would that be any different than than just the fact that in in reactions things tend to go from an unstable state to a more stable state like they they want to become more stable we see this all the time in systems across chemistry and physics i don't see why mm -hmm life would necessarily be an exception to that. But of course, no one has a problem with that. That's common sense. It's only it's only problematic when it's life and when the process in life is being tied to something that may not require their preconceived notions about how things came to be, then it's a problem to them. Something is either going to achieve some degree of at least temporal balance, or it's going to collapse. Hmm. And so that's that's where we're at, and that's what life is. And that's what the orbits of the planets are. It's a it's a it's a, an illusion, perhaps in some cases, but it's at least a temporal balance, where we're only slightly bombarded with other bodies, in the boiling chaos that is Great. the clockwork precision of God. Yeah, our, our our sun has an end. I think it's got another five billion years before the energy is out uh, our universe itself is, is going towards that the same destiny it looks like everything is distant to to to, to nothing um, and when i say nothing here i'm saying the phys physical nothing not the philosoph philosophical one um and, and it might just keep turning around now let's start with the first i just want to throw in something on what you said because there's people listening to that who think well what will we do then Brazil has been long extinct before that. Don't worry about it. Don't hey, worry you don't know that. We could, we might make it. Yeah. Well, I, I remember something really funny. Christopher Hitchens was talking about the same thing, and, I, and he, he said the sun is is got five billion years to go. And somebody said, "Excuse me, did you say five billion years or five million years?" I said five billion. I said thank God. Uh, <laughs> as if this is going to make any difference. Big difference, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it could. I mean, it's a thousand times more likely that we'll be around in five million years as opposed to five billion. So, so but, the, the yeah. first serious question that came on the Myth Vision uh, uh, group uh, with our friend Derek um, is that um, uh, speciation. One person has challenged the, the today's broadcast, and Aaron has um, uh, responded to him. And it was mainly about speciation. Uh, and he actually uh, quoted verbatim uh, a C. Meyer uh, Discovery Institute um, a portion where it says, well, we do accept uh, microevolution. We can see things are trying to adapt, but we don't accept macroevolution. Uh, we think no species sort of emerge or um, uh, they don't, uh, you know, uh, new, uh, new species don't emerge on the back of, of evolution. Evolution is just the adaptability of species to suit their environment. And we'll start with Eric on that. Oh, sorry, with Aaron, because he is the person who um, challenged that one first. To my experience, when creationists say that they, and this, they always do, that they say that they, they accept microevolution, but they reject macroevolution, they don't know what either of these words mean to begin with. And secondly, the fact of the matter is that they usually reject micro and accept macro. 
because by definition, macroevolution is the large scale uh, uh, evolution, which means literally, and it's and many uh, academic sources will spell this out, that it's the beginning with the emergence of new species is the beginning of macroevolution. So they'll admit that, as I said before, that Ken Ham and Kent Hoban will say that speciation is observed and that's just something we expect and we see that when that happens. And Ken Ham would say that it's at the genus level or the family level or even at the level of a taxonomic order. But what they don't accept is that mutations are the source of new genetic information. And this is high school biology. Well, at least at least first year college biology will tell you in the textbooks it'll explain how mutations are the source of new genetic information. But but the creationists deny that. So in fact, they reject micro and accept macro because they don't know fucking anything. <laughs> uh, uh, Erica, I'm sorry if uh, I was being too polite. That's all right. No, I mean, we'll, we'll assume, let's take them at their word, right? Let's just assume that they are okay with microevolution and not macroevolution, even though they are okay with macroevolution and thus certain types of speciation within these arbitrarily decided kinds. Um, where does it stop, right? The, the same exact mechanisms that dictate the, the descent of, of different species, right, dictate the descent at the genus level and at the family level and at the order level and class and so on and so forth. Um, go back in time, where does it stop, right? All canids are related, all ursids are related, but neither of them are related to each other. Okay, sure. Uh, well, where do amphicyonids fall, right? Where, where do the dog birds fall? <laughs> are, they, are they their own kind? And if so, what about the ancestor of that individual? Where, if you could line them all up, where's the line drawn and why is it drawn there? And more importantly, what is the criteria by which we actually decide where these lines are drawn. Is it genetic? Is it morphologic? Is it common sense? They do horribly with this in the hominins. I mean, they are just, it is abysmal when you look at, at human evolution to be sure, but they don't have the first, at least they give that a try. Go further back in primates and they don't have the first clue, right? And that's because very few of the people who are, um, who are actually trying to draw these lines are actually formally trained at all in anything even adjacent to biology. Um, and the ones that are have just the, some of the most powerful cognitive dissonance that I've ever seen in my life, right? Because sometimes they they clearly show that they understand these concepts, but the second that it trudges into the territory of doing something empirical in in evolutionary biology or you know adjacent adjacent subject, uh, it's like their their brain becomes static. It's it's really unsettling to see. Uh, but yeah, like wh where's the line drawn and why is it drawn there? Let's let's see some empirical work done to, to actually make a case for mm -hmm. something that's standardized as well, that, that can be applied in the same way to hominins as it can be to ursids, as it can be to um, birds versus uh, other theropods, right? Let's let's see something like that. I, I'd be curious. Well, you know, you Erica, the devil is in the details. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> I have a bit to add here if, about, if I can here. Yes, please, Dave. Go ahead. Um, so I think the problem is that these people, you know, they they they're not thinking like scientists. They just think like somebody who's at the zoo, right? What's where did that limb come from? Where that wing wing come from? Where that fin come from? <laughs> so first of all, the problem is they don't take even ten seconds to Google and look at the incredible the 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 near seamless continuum of forms, both from uh, not not even just in the fossil record, even in extants. <clears throat> Excuse me in extant species that exists all these animals that they don't even know exist today on the earth that sort of uh branch all of these things but but more importantly they don't have the faintest grasp of the genetics surrounding how a body plan emerges or something like that like if you ask somebody um how how does how do we go from a single celled zygote to uh, a fully developed animal watch their 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 faces go blank they don't have any idea how this happens right it's in the dna and then the body plan comes. Well, so if you change the DNA, it's feasible that you can change the body plan, especially those particular genes that are controlling certain aspects of the body plan. Obviously, if those change, the body plan can change. But the the, the big issue here is that none of them, even the premium uh, brand uh, creationists here, your Michael Behe and these guys, 
they'll write these entire books. B, he wrote this entire book, Darwin Devolves. And the whole thing is that, oh, all the mutations degrade the information and they take away features and everything. And it's like, dude, you're a biochemist. Like, how have you not heard about like gene duplication and neo-functionalization? Mm -hmm. You get a gene, you get two copies of the gene. One of them gets mutations, becomes a different gene. The other one retains the original function or a whole chromosome duplication. Or you can have de novo genes where a promoter goes to a new region of the of the of the chromosome. And now an entire sequence of non-coding GNA is suddenly a gene. Right. So there's all these ways to get completely new genes and new proteins. And if any of them have to do with uh, with generating a new body plan, this is going to have a tremendous effect on the morphology of the organism. So even these guys who are like the kings of, the, of, of proselytizing this stuff, they don't get they don't understand what they're talking about. So how can you like when you when you say you reject uh, macro evolution and you don't even have any any ability to discuss any of these mechanisms? Or, I mean, like what's what conversation are we are we even having here? You know what I mean? So when we're talking micro and macro, it's to do with speciation. And, 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 um, uh, and one of the things that uh, is, is even sometimes debated within the biological um, a conversation about the tools, is natural selection enough to justify speciation? Or are we talking about extra layers like genetic and geographical drift uh, being isolated from the ancestor population, um, uh, getting used and adapting to new environment where the migrant population is, is, is new food, there is new food sources, new uh, climate, and, and therefore over 100 mi millions of years, that particular species will take a completely different form and, and, and it will change shape and it will look completely different from uh, the population of their ancestors. And I would like Erica to comment well, on that. Hold on, but before, before you jumped over to her, you said completely different. So they're going to say elephants gave birth to pine trees or that hamsters. Oh, okay. No, 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 not that. Con yeah. It's still, it's still an animal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, so I have opinions on the concept of species um, and these opinions are popular in some groups and unpopular in others. Uh, I, I would point out, you know, that we utilize species as, as a means by which to categorize organisms, right? Because we are humans, we're pattern seekers, and we like to group things into categories. But there isn't a single species concept that can be universally applied to extant and extinct life that nicely separates organisms into categories with no overlap. Uh, and what I mean by that is if we had every organism that has ever existed and we could line them all up leading back to a last universal common ancestor, it would be impossible to mark where one species begins and another ends. It's, it's like a color gradient, right? So we have the fortune of living, you know, in a, in a time period where we can sort of horizontally slice things and look at them and say, okay, well, you know, these two things seem to be separate species. And we usually use things like the biological species concept with extant life and the evolutionary species concept or the phylogenetic species concept with extinct life. And you're really, if you're really interested in this, you can check out Zacos 2016. He does a really good job outlining all the species concepts and then being like, none of them are perfect, right? Um, but something that I would like to point out, you know, with regard to speciation, and not necessarily where we draw that line, but sort of the process, some of the processes behind it, is that one concept that I've seen, at least that creationists or those who don't understand evolution never seem to nail, is the idea that mutations, and it is of course the accumulation of mutations, the accumulation of variation, then the selection within that variation that leads eventually to speciation, they don't understand that mutations are context specific. Like they seem to have this idea that there's like this ultimate fitness that is good in every category and humans, you know, things have been trying to evolve into humanity since the dawn of time. And I feel like that that's a really good place to start when, when you're discussing speciation and the mechanisms of evolution with creationists or other people who just don't really understand it is to discuss, you know, the nature of traits and environments, because this, this is where selection is acting, right? Before we're even looking necessarily at things like gene flow and drift, we're looking just at mutation and natural selection and the context. And, and this is how, this is how it works, but they don't know that, right? So instead they just say, well, speciation, that's, it's still, what is it they say? It's still a fruit fly. It's still a dog. It's still a cat, you know? Um, well, you're still a primate, aren't you? You're still a mammal. You know, you're still a eukaryote. Eukaryote, uh, yeah. And birds are still dinosaurs. Birds are still dinosaurs, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'd like to pose the same question uh, to Aaron, but uh, I want to add the context of, uh, because I do agree with Erica's um, that species is, a, is an indexing, marking, uh, very useful um, uh, way of, of organizing ideas, but it's more like a spectrum to me. Oh, it's always been a spectrum to me of all these um, animals. Um, uh, but it's taxonomy and the disagreement sometimes within the taxo taxonomical arrangements of things can can betray the sentiment of of really we, we really don't have to we or we find it difficult to put a certain species in a certain category on based on what and, and there's a bit of a discussion going in taxonomy on the back of that the idea of species i mean it, it's somebody was arguing with me just the other day about this saying that species was a bastardized term and i said yes it is creationists have tried to bastardize it all they can but in reality, in biology, we understand that, you know, in different types of biology, we'll have different types of reproduction. And, and uh, so the species category will have different definitions in different places, like the way that uh, microbes, for example, reproduce uh, is not going to be the same thing as reproductive, as sexually reproductive animals or plants. And those are both different from each other. So. The easiest, since we're usually talking about human evolution and humans are animals, despite all of the claims creationists make, the definition for species within sexually reproductive animals is whether uh, two organisms are closely related enough that they will still interbreed and produce fertile offspring after their kind, which is the Jewish word min, right? That's the only thing that the Bible was specific about. Can they produce after their kind? And if they can't, then they're different kinds but of course we can we move the goalposts as uh, however necessary so while they will say then they often bring up dogs as their first argument I and mean, they'll say that you know that we, we can any five-year-old can tell you that a dog is a you know dog kind except that um not all dogs can interbreed yes chihuahuas can technically interbreed with great danes but neither of them can interbreed with the African painted dog or the Australian bush, uh, the, the um, uh, South American bush dog or the Asian raccoon dog. These are all distinctly different species. They're still dogs. Any five-year-old should be able to tell you that, but they're genetically distinct, too, too much so to interbreed anymore. And there's a gray area. Yes, because it, there's never anything as binary as what believers want to see. So... Are wolves and domestic dogs different species? That depends on your definition. There, there is obviously a, a period of flux in there. Whether wolves and dogs will interbreed is often determined by whether their populations are compromised. Uh, under normal circumstances, when they're both healthy populations, they tend not to. Tigers and lions will not interbreed, even in a few places, because there is a place in India where you can get both of them. As I, as I, like I tigers or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you you it, it is possible to get lions and tigers in the same place, but they don't tend to interbreed unless they're in captivity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just whether they chemically can, but whether they physically will. And when they won't interbreed at all anymore, because look at humans and chimpanzees, for example. It's possible since we've 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 come up with hybrids between camels and llamas, and they are much further, more distantly related than our humans and chimpanzees, then chemically it would likely be possible for humans and chimpanzees, though physically it is not, and culturally it's verboten. Nobody even wants to try that experiment. So we can safely say that we're different species on that criteria. Dave, uh... Very interesting, Aaron. Dave, you got anything to add to that? Not too much. I mean, those all, the different the distinctions, the different types of species. I mean, creationist confusion on this stems exclusively from stubbornness and an unwillingness to learn literally anything about biology. That's really the bottom line. Yeah. Well, well I mean, let's let's bring some examples here. Uh, the 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 London Underground mosquito um, is one example of a speciation. Uh, after it, but then it's not very popular because we'll say, well, it's still a mosquito. It's still, well, it, it cannot now reproduce with the ancestor population, but it's, um, uh, uh, they don't want to take that as a speciation or a, a precursor to speciation. Do we have any other um, uh, examples, Erica, Aaron, and Dave, um, of, of speciation that happened in our lifetime? They're demanding that a mosquito turn into a pine tree. Right. <laughs> 
They're, re- they're refusing to accept what evolution is. They don't understand. And you can look it up anywhere. Yep, that, like uh, Evolution 101, the beginner's primer from UC Berkeley. That, and it's one of many uh, university academic uh, institutions that will explain that evolution is descent with inherent modification. So the simplest description is that one original group provides two daughter groups, both of which are still the same category as their ancestors, but they're distinct from each other. Each of the daughter groups likewise will produce two or at least two more subgroups, unless one of them goes extinct and they're increasingly distinct or yeah, increasingly distinct from their, their cousins and probably increasingly distinct from their ancestors as well, but they still belong to the parent category. Humans have, where Carolus Linnaeus originally said that we had seven taxonomic ranks, I've counted 70, so 10 times that many taxonomic ranks, to which humans still belong to every ancestral clade we ever belonged to. Everything that our ancestors were, we still are, even if we create a new clade to which they didn't belong. I think I have a solution to this. I, uh, there's something I'd want to commission from someone, from some kind of taxonomist or something where I think the problem is uh, uh, people want to see, like they, they don't take even the 30 seconds to go look at all the transitional forms that we've uncovered. I'd like for someone to make a singular image, which would have to be admittedly enormous, that contains virtually or if not every known extinct or extant species of life and show all of the continuums that people are not seeing because they won't go on the internet and go look at all these things. Right. So, I mean, admittedly, a lot of it would have to be somewhat hypothetical because we're not absolutely positive, right? People keep rearranging the file on where they go on the tree and everything, but um, just something, a singular image where people can look and go, okay, here's a turtle, right. And here's, you know, uh, I don't know. Notosaurus. Yeah, something or you know, that would be more recent. Right. But you can take two things that, that are seemingly completely unrelated and go back and look at little Troll. pictures of all the known forms. Right. Because turtles. Right. We know so many transitional species from modern turtles down to something more resembling a dinosaur. Right. Or I'm not sure exactly where it would go, but there, there's a lot of those. And so just you could you could start in any two places and just kind of trace along and witness this slow, gradual change in morphology until you slowly get to something where you're like, all right, they came, th- this is the, the, the most recent common ancestor ancestor of these two animals. Right. And it's, so it's, it's like, so it, it's just, the, just to finish the analogy, if you took, if you picked a dozen colors and just put them like this and go, Oh, those are all different colors. And then you bring the whole color wheel. It's going to snap into place. It's going to make sense. That's, you, I want I'll, that for animals. That's it. I was thinking, <laughs> let's go to the chase. The faithful are not really interested in animals. They want this particular diagram between Australopithecus and Homo sapiens because well, it's all about us, really. Well, that'll be on there too. No, I've, I've, on there. I've made that diagram. I, I made that diagram myself. I took oh. an example of, of, oh God, I mean, there's probably 17 hominins on it, starting from Sailanthropus chinensis, moving all the way up to anatomically modern Homo sapiens. And I've presented it several times. Where's the line drawn, right? Where, where's the ape kind? Because Monkey, that's human. That's what they always say, right? Where's like, the where's, where, where's the line drawn? And, you know, it, it, it gets extraordinarily dicey with the hominins because there are so many different species of hominins that are also incredibly diverse. I mean, look at Homo erectus. Well, even since Ustricto, this thing is diverse, right? Wide range of brain case sizes, wide range of material cultures, right? Uh, but you include the rest of the hominins. It's not doable. It, it is that color gradient, as Dave suggested. You, you cannot so, drop a line. You reckon it's going to be a matter of that Dawkins um, uh blood boiling uh, interview where he was telling the lady, you know, the natural museums around the world are filled with, and actually I've witnessed that firsthand. I was in Europe, Germany, Prague, every natural museum you can name. There's a beautiful um, specimen of everything you can think of. And this lady would, would, would show me the evidence, show me the evidence. And you go everywhere in every natural museum. And she just refuses to acknowledge or attempt uh, finding the truth. Well, they they don't want they don't want the answer, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. It, the the answer is not palatable to them, and so it's easier to just say that it doesn't exist. Um, they they don't like the hominins, no. But in another interesting one that's that's tough for them to draw a line between is is the the cetaceans, right? You've got ancient Indo Hyas, and a really cool. There's two really cool ways to link the you know, modern cetaceans to a land dwelling ancestor. One is the astragalus, right? 
um, sort of a hinge joint in the in the limbs. And then the other is the involucrum, which is an inner ear structure that is found only exclusively in modern day cetaceans. That is it. Okay, so first of all, the involucrum exists in numerous different, you know, steps, transitionals, if it were, although transitional, all species are ultimately transitional. It's an endohyus, right? A little goat-sized hooved animal with an astragalus and an involucrum. And it's in um, pachycetus and ambulocetus alike. They both have this same structure. Again, no other artiodactyl has an involucrum. It doesn't exist in any of them. It's in every modern day cetacean and no living land animal. And yet all through the past, we find it not just in land animals, but in precedingly more aquatic animals that are living more along the coastline. Their bones are getting denser, which is what we see in modern Cyrenians. It's indicative and, and hippopotamuses. It's indicative of, of having a more semi-aquatic lifestyle. And not only is this happening, but at the same time in these same organisms, they're losing the limbs. The, the behind limbs are, are being reduced until in, look at something like Basilosaurus, they're like this big, like literally this big in a whale that, that's the size of a sperm whale. It's it's ridiculous. And so as as of now, you know, the most recent time that uh, I went to the Ark Encounter, Ken Ham's museum, um, they have Pachycetus as a kind on the Ark. Pachycetus was brought by Noah and his, and his pals onto the Ark because, boy, that's a that's a hard sell, isn't it? Right. That that. Whale evolution did not did not, did not occur in that modern cetaceans can't call back to a land dwelling ancestor. They are being dragged one knuckled every single step of the way. And eventually you're gonna get one of two camps. It's either all miraculous and science is deceptive, or it's God just did it that way. Like those are the only two options here. Um we'll see which way they go. The problem is every single creationist tuned out 10 seconds into everything you just said. Yeah, I know. I know yeah. they did. I know they did, because I'm not James. Mm -hmm. Erica, I have a question. When, yeah. when you went through the Ark Encounter, were you on your own or were you guided? Nope, I took my uh, took my mom. I was the guided tour. And, and she put okay. on my case about swearing too much. I had one, somebody on, under the employ of Answers in Genesis as my guide through the the, the oh encounter. oh my god how was that I, oh that was so much fun <laughs> for you <laughs> for them, I can't even imagine. so coming up to what they they, they wanted to call the, the the transitional species for the tyrannosaurs mm. which they would not admit were dromaeosaurs or would not if conflate or or even connect to dromaeosaurs when i asked for that where are their feathers because every dromaeosaur is now known to have feathers. Of course, I don't get no answer from Answers in Genesis. And when we come to Pachycetus, which, by the way, the artists that did that rendering, I thought did a beautiful job. Oh, the models uh, were impeccable. They all look great, honestly. Yeah, and Pachycetus, I would put, it had a flattened kind of a beaver tail, which is consistent with the evolution of that animal. We don't we don't have proof that their that their tails were flattened, but we know that because of their subsequent derivation that at some point they flattened and at some point they shaped into flukes. And so the idea that Pachycetus would have something equivalent to a beaver tail was perfectly reasonable. So they're capable of understanding that. But when I can, when I confront them on the very point that you just made, this is an ideal example of a transitional species. Why the fuck would you have to put a transitional whale on the ark? On the earth. And if you're not, if you're going to put this one on, why not Cuchicetus? Yeah. Do they think, do, are they now admitting that there were like 5 million animals on the ark or like, what are they doing now? I don't even know. Oh, no, no, no. The, the argument is doing. so much better than that. They get this. They don't accept microevolution because they don't accept that mutations can contribute to, to uh, new genetic information. But they also say that they don't accept macroevolution, but they do accept that the, or the evolution of new species is possible, new genus, new family, new orders. They accept, they accept the idea that then they promote this, that they started with 1,400 original species, original kinds, and that from that we get however many millions of modern species in like a thousand years immediately yeah. as soon as the boat lands right you so know they believe in hyper evolution of all, it, uh, 90 percent of all biomass goes extinct as soon as they come out the door and all of the speciation 
super no. hyper caffeinated electro mega evolution happened immediately as soon as the boat landed it's, and it's, it's, fast it's, fossilization and everything God, we, we need to contextualize this too though because they the, the general consensus with answers in genesis is that there is a single big ice age right after the flood all right we have a lot of proboscideans that are fossilized and indeed frozen solid in the north so they have to account for proboscidean diversity one of the most long-lived longest gestating and slowest growing animals and they have to account for gomphotheres mastodons mammoths dinotherium they have to account for all of it almost immediately after these suckers come off the yard so my one of my uh, buddies on who comes has helped out with the channel a couple times this guy walker we did the math for to account for the level of proboscidean diversity that, that we know of just that we know of Every single proboscidean has to be a separate species than its mother. And when I say separate species, I mean in how we categorize it as impeccably distinct because these are fossil organisms. So, you know, it, it's absolutely absurd. And that's setting aside the fact that, you know, you mentioned how are they fitting all the animals on the ark. That's not even their first problem. Magic. If you have, God, if magic. You have these big animals, assume they're babies, assume they're babies, assume a basal metabolic rate right, where they are of, of a sleeping animal and assume the highest calorie food just for the proboscideans, assuming we've got 15 proboscidean kinds on the ark, you're taking up roughly 60% of the space on that entire boat with alfalfa just for the food for 15 kinds. It's not going to work, right? Uh, 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 they don't care. They, I mean, and you know, you do all this work and as you said, Dave, they don't listen. So, you know, I've wasted a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the best response I've heard on, on this is, was from Ricky Gervais, the, the British comedian. It was a stand-up comedy on, on animals. And he said, you know, one of the questions was posed is like how you get all these carnivorous um, animals to be on, on the same um, uh, vessel as, as, as other animals without mayhem. And he said, well, uh, because in, in the time of need, we all pull together. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's that's the only explanation. It, it just it, it is so it, it is so uh, childish to be honest to think that. And uh, I've, I've got the first. Um, the lion uh, knew that if he ate the gazelle, that there wouldn't be any more gazelles to eat ever again. So he, yeah. he held his appetite. Exactly. Yeah. He ate an iguanodon instead. <laughs> oh, Matt Powell is here. Isn't he the guy that thinks like there's air in space? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, somebody I'm pretending to be Matt Powell. He's the he's the gay guy who hates gay people. I'm pretty sure is who that is. Oh, I, I used to call him a lot of those. but I was told that that was inappropriate. <laughs> what? <laughs> that is... I think I think Matt wants to step up in Kent's wake. He wants to come out from. Kent's no, he doesn't want Kent's to step shadow. up. He doesn't. Yeah, he turned it down. There was an interview uh, with him in in Kent, and he was like, "Yeah, we, my family are leaving DAL. That's probably the smartest thing he's ever done. As far as Matt. he's ever done." There Matt, was a, you're, there was a you're the crappiest a apologist I've ever seen. Just keep quiet. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I, I got to say, a, a couple of years back, when they were, they were going to do the American Atheist National Convention in Phoenix, Arizona, which it will be again in, in this April. But, you know, COVID kind of set everything back. So we're two years behind schedule. Yes, American Atheist is going to be a national convention in Phoenix this year in 2023. But it was going to be a couple of years ago. And... Uh, Matt Powell was pretending as if he was up for a debate. And so I said, okay, well, here's you, you were living, he was living in Phoenix at that time. And I said, well, this would be a great thing. We're going to do the American Atheist National Convention. Let's do a, a, just a bit of entertainment. Let's have your loopy ass come in and do a debate with me in front of a thousand atheists in an audience. That would be hysterical. That would be I would funny. love that. Yeah. And for all of his bravado, all of his bluffing and puffing up, of course, he he scurried away in cowardice and tried to say that I was cheating some way. But I I got all of the emails. I can show the whole thread about how he ran away with his tail between his legs or up his ass. I don't know. This guy, I don't I don't know anything really that he does. Just somebody sent me one link to one of his videos like a while like a while ago. And he was talking about Big Bang. And he's like, Big Bang is dumb because in a solar system, sometimes you can have one planet rotating the other way from the other planets. What? <laughs> he said oh, that. And on, I, I think I, I wrote a comment being like, "You're a moron. You don't know anything about." I, I got another one. I saw a video once of Matt Powell holding a chicken, and he's sitting there holding this chicken, and he's talking about how how crazy it is to suggest that that this thing descends from dinosaurs because how could a T Rex's arms evolve backwards to become its legs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so about do, you, legs do you guys think the whole thing? 
the whole thing boils down to um, an argument from personal incredulity. I don't understand how this works, so therefore it's a farce. In, yeah, in Matt Powell's ignorance. case, it doesn't. Matt, Matt Powell knows that he's got a scam going. He's a professional liar. That's it. That's all. He knows that people, that, that his a lot of his followers, many of them are genuinely stupid and just believe what he says without question. But a lot of them want to make believe rather desperately, and they just want anything that, 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 that'll reaffirm their bullshit belief. And he knows that they'll pay for whatever lie he tells them if it reinforces that belief. So that's what he is. He's a professional liar. Yeah, I think you're giving him way too much credit. He's really stupid. <laughs> well, I know that Kent Hovind is profoundly stupid, so I'm going to guess that Powell is too. But, but I have to say that Powell is probably so smarter than Hovind because guy. Powell moved on to the, the Hovind um, cult compound <clears throat> and realized a little while into it that I need to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Oh, he did. I don't know the the draw. I knew that I saw him sitting on the in the in the room there. I don't I don't know like what their yeah, involvement he, is he's now. High tailing it, dude. He is high tailing okay. it. Okay, so, uh, that's it's smart. Just, so that's one smart thing he did. That's one smart thing. I'll give you credit farce, for that. Uh, the first comment. Uh, one beautiful thing about the di all disciplines of sciences, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, is something that Karl Popper um, has added some time ago, which is falsifiability. A, a strong theory, just like Einstein came up with the uh, general relativity and he said, if I'm wrong, this would not happen. But my calculation is going to say that light is going to bend uh, uh, um, uh, around the sun and, and, and therefore it will look shifted. Uh, and he was vindicated and it was falsified at the time. What is the, can we just provide the audiences here, starting with Erica, um, uh, things that we can use to falsify uh, the theory of evolution. Oh gosh, I mean, that's that's going to be really tough, honestly. I, I've been I've been asked this. Before, I can go first. Like, yeah, you go first, Aaron. I mean, can, there are can certain we... things that we predict and expect with evolution. So, for example, when we argue about the transitional species, and people say, "Well, you know, Darwin predicted that there would be transitional species, and we never and we ain't never found none," except that he predicted and described two of them specifically that we did in fact find plus and a we thousand found, others <laughs> just he he gave a description for two of them one of them was found within two two years of his uh publication so he already knew that his theory was vindicated while he was still alive that was archaeopteryx lithographica and then there was australopithecus afarensis which wasn't identified as a transitional species until a century later when darwin died that one was still called the missing link 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 and so now we found just within Archaeopteryx, just within the transition from dinosaurs to birds, we found myriad transitions and also between, you know, apes to man. Again, myriad links. But those were the first two that were specifically identified, described uh, by, by Darwin himself. But you can't get the creationists to admit, OK, well, this is what he said and this is what we found. OK, well, I'll give you that one. No, that'll never happen because it's all about make believe. Well, find you know, a good start would be find find the Cambrian bunny, right? Find an organism that is you know completely out of place where it should be, and that where it shouldn't be. Excuse me, and then manage to um, sort of account for every possible intrusion into that layer. But you know, I've been asked before, like, how would you falsify evolution? At this stage, it's going to be tough because thousands of papers, perhaps tens of thousands of papers, every single year studies rely on the assumptions of evolutionary theory and their hypotheses come to fruition. We base our agricultural industry on it. We base our medical industry on it. We rely on the theory of evolution for so much of our modern understanding and of, of science and of biology rather and our, our lifestyle. So how could you falsify it at this point? Um, the mechanism, I don't think you could, honestly. I, I think it, it it is as solid as you know, our ideas of, of germ theory, if not significantly yeah. more solid. Every as development as, of antibiotic resistance is yeah. a vindication of evolutionary biology. Precisely. Well, I, well, by the way, when uh, I go uh, into PubMed, when I go into PubMed and I type in, you know, evolution, I get tens of thousands of responses, 74,566 replies. Well, and each subsequently relies, each 
study that relies on a previous study further vindicates the results of the former, right? Assuming it's making the same assumptions and, and yeah. sort of predicated on the results. The, the reason now, I asked this question, Erica, is, is not to, uh, I, I completely understand that it's solid right now, evolution, but, but, but it's been said that a theory, whatever theory is going to be posed, it needs to come with a, a, a set of falsifications, even though they might not happen or they might not be able to, uh, you know, every time you test them, uh, they're always there. But if it doesn't, then it becomes a non-scientific theory, just like an uh, intelligent design. It cannot yeah, so be part. We, we oh. do have that. I mean, I did a video called Falsifying Phylogeny, which is actually talking about exactly how to do that. So evolution proposes or explains that, you know, that, that biodiversity is going to happen this way. And so there are certain things that it cannot do, that an, interior, that an intelligent designer could do. So an intelligent designer can take, you know, we, all, we always hear the, the analogy of cars coming into this, right? Well, you know, the Volkswagen Beetle for the longest time was an air-cooled rear engine, uh, uh, and, and uh, it, then it became a water-cooled front engine made out of a completely different alloy, right? So it's aluminum then, and now it's, you know, Nikola and something else. So we, an intelligent designer can change everything about it. It's still a Beetle, right? It's just everything has been fundamentally changed. But in biology, that can't happen. It can only build on whatever has emerged already, you know, and, and accentuate or, or influence that. So one of the things that cannot happen is that you cannot get, because birds are dinosaurs and therefore reptiles, you cannot get the wings of a reptile mounted onto the body of a mammal. So the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz or a pegasus or a griffin, none of those things are possible with evolution. So, and it may sound ridiculous, but you, you know, you find, find a, a, a Pegasus. That's one way of disproving evolution. Show something that cannot have evolved according to evolution. Right. Mechanism. Because you so morphologically took someone, something from this branch and this branch and merged them in a way that is completely incompatible with the history of, of biological life. Yeah. The, yeah, that's the it. best I mean, they've got, the best <clears throat> they've got is the platypus, which yeah. exactly fits evolution because all mon all mammals were originally monotremes. And they had a lower body temperature, and the bill that the mon that the the duck bill platypus has is not homologous with a with a with a bird's bill. It's it's very different. It's, it's structurally entirely different. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, mean, I cut you off, Dave. Go at, ahead. at this point, after 150 years or whatever of discovering thousands upon thousands of species and seeing how they all fall flawlessly into this evolutionary tree, the falsifiability would be a deity floating down to Earth and saying. Ha ha, gotcha. I actually did it. Here's a video of me doing everything. Like, that's well, how ridiculous it would have to be. Well, right. I mean, that that's kind of where where I was trying like trying to head, right? Is because at mm -hmm. this point, if if evolution is to be falsified and everything that that entails, you have to propose something else to explain all of the data that has up until this point matched pristinely with evolutionary theory, right? All of that has to be accounted for. When a previous idea gets booted out, right, or, or you know, um, found to be, I guess, an inferior, inferior to this new idea that's come along, the new idea has to also explain all the old data. That's that's kind of the point. So evolution has yeah. been falsifiable every single step along yes, the way here. The problem right. is we're 150 years of steps in, and it hasn't been falsified yet. So how do you how do you I mean, even from like a statistics standpoint, how what are the odds that we get seemingly such a such a robust support for an idea that is if the creationists are yeah. yeah. well, completely wrong this entire time? That's where we're at with like the intelligent design movement, like some of the faces that are trying to be the most credible is they they sort of accept like they accept old earth and then they accept like all of these events happened and these species emerged at these times, but they just kind of take, they just lie about small details and go, okay, this was impossible, which ends up resulting in a God who is just like walking along this timeline and going, Hmm, okay, I'll create this now. And then, Oh, okay. You know what? I'm going to create some of these other things now. And it's just like, I can't believe you guys worship this God. He's such a loser. Like, why can't you just make a universe where all of like everything would have happened according to how we understand scientifically he's just sitting there like oh well, let's try something new now you know like i mean right like that that version yes to be certain i mean even intelligent design intelligent design as as far as i'm concerned has been falsified speaking of falsifiability oh, yeah. because back in the day there was a very clear prediction made by intelligent design right so after we get 
the, the, the genomes of a great many organisms sequenced right around 2005 and dipping into 2010 and beyond, um, a very you know, weak counter argument was made by the intelligent design community. They come out and they're like, well, it's common design. Okay, well, it just looks like evolution. All right, well, um, sure. You want to say it's common design in functional sequences and that things look alike because you're repurposing parts? Fine. Why is there a nested hierarchy in unconstrained sequences? Or sorry, um, uh, opposite. Why, why do we have our non-functional DNA also falling into a nested hierarchy? This should not be the case. This means that DNA that it doesn't do anything also falls into a nested hierarchy. If things are only looking like they're related because of design, because of the functional aspects of the DNA, then the non-functional DNA should not fall into a nested hierarchy. This is a very simple prediction that right. they went out on a limb and effectively made, and it's been blasted to smithereens, right? The nested hierarchy is ubiquitous, ubiquitous across the entire genome. So what are they still out here talking about? Someone help me here, right? <laughs> I, I think the uh, our intelligent design um, never fitted the criteria of a theory, uh, scientific theory to start with, because it's, it's the whole thing is predicated on the rejection of evolution. And, and that alone doesn't give you a scientific theory. It doesn't predict. It doesn't uh, it doesn't have falsifiability. It doesn't tell you the mechanics or the details of it or what it says are uh, uh, irreducible complexity and irreducible specificity. And um, uh, I don't understand how this has happened. And therefore, there must be a designer in the background. But I cannot explain to you all the flaws in those supposedly uh, perfect designs. Uh, it just I don't think it, it ever fitted a, a, a scientific theory. Well, be, I've be often he, said that intelligent design meets exactly none of the criteria required of a scientific theory. Yeah, but they but they know that. And so them trying to appear as scientific as possible have actually caved like Behe did outline uh, guidelines for falsifiability. Then, of course, they were immediately falsified right? because it's not it's nice. So <laughs> structures were shown structures that 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 met his criteria for irreducible complexity were shown to were observed to have evolved. So it's 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 in the trash can, right? Irreducible complexity is in the trash can. He set the guidelines. They were met. They were observed to evolve. So but they keep uh, actually I don't hear them pushing it too much now, but I think that they I think they still do. But, I still um, hear their followers bring it up, and I have to remind yeah. them that every one of the arguments brought forth for in, uh, irreducible complexity was disproven scientifically before yeah. it was also shown to be fraudulent in a court of law. Exactly. Yeah, the Kitzmiller v. Dover, and they didn't do too well with that one. So, yeah. Well, this co the, uh, comment is pretty much what uh, Aaron and I were talking off air. You know, if you come with a, a, a presupposition of some sort, um, you will never be able to uh, to have that logical discourse where you can convince somebody of, of, of something unless something happens to them drastically that will shift their views or, or change their minds. Um, but you, you presuppose there's no God. <laughs> That's what they say, right? Yeah, we were all former believers. Most of us were, were former believers, so we did not pre-propose this. <laughs> This is a conclusion we came to after analyzing the evidence. I, I, I just become completely uninterested the second that, you know, you're allowing miracles or inspired scripture to dictate what you believe and why you believe it. Like young earth creationism and creationism in general is only interesting to me insofar as it proposes that this can be supported scientifically. And that's where you can come in and have some fun. I say, okay, well, you say that, let's, let's look at it. Can it be? Um, or is it completely annihilated at every turn? Um, and we all know where that where that ends up. But once once we start allowing for miracles here and miracles there, and you know, well, that part I'm just going to interpret in this way. It's it's like I just I think it's boring. I, I don't I'm not interested anymore. What I'd like to take this opportunity to fangirl just a little bit. I'm I'm <laughs> delighted that I'm that I'm on a panel with Gutsit Gibbon and Professor Dave because I have huge admiration for both of them. Now, as I mentioned to you privately before either of them came on camera, and I said I was going to repeat this once we were on the air, uh, I, I have huge respect for Professor Dave because everybody wants to bring up James fucking tour because he has a degree and that means he's better than me. But they also use the, the, you know, the fact that Kent Hovind has a mail order catalog degree and that, that that's supposed to mean that he's better than me too. The fact that their arguments are complete shit 
doesn't seem to matter to these people. And Erica is one of the is a rare case in that this is somebody who is really passionate about promoting the science, but also simultaneously understands the necessity of countering apologetics, because there's very few people, particularly in her generation, and 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 probably worse. I say particularly in her generation, but it's actually probably worse in my generation. Most people who advocate the science don't know that it is in, that it is necessary to also counter apologetics. So. I'm very, very happy with her. <laughs> Thank you, R. Jesus. I wasn't expecting the, the compliment. No, I, it's it's <laughs> always an honor to, to be hanging out with you guys. I mean, R, I was watching your videos before I ever even made a Reddit account talking about the, the creationism stuff. So I think I actually emailed you like five or six years ago asking you for a source on something. You got right back to me and I was like, oh my God. Like, he, he the I, and the idea that you were asking me for a resource <laughs> no, no you, you had this cool chart and I, I remember you got it right to me. It was great. And obviously being being on here with Professor Dave, I mean, like the material that, that Dave puts out there is just so systematic in the district. It's so systematic. And Everybody I had to do it. <laughs> you, yes. And now. I don't need to do it now. You're, yeah. You did it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you did the tour thing too, because like the, my stuff, I stick to a lot of, I mean, I'm pretty restricted in, in what I, I guess I'm specialized in. And when we get down into the abiogenesis stuff and particularly biochemistry, I took it's a biochemistry. different world. Yeah. It's a different I, world. Yeah. I, I just don't. And, and, you know, systems. It's very niche. Yeah. That. I didn't it know is, much well, about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just been very helpful to. to James also sure. still does not know anything about systems. Chemistry. I know he doesn't because he I really watched doesn't. videos and listen, man, I, it's not good that I know about systems chemistry and, and he is not and going to study chemists. Like, I mean, on. I was done with the guy. I had moved on, but uh, they, they had not. So <laughs> this last no. series was astounding what he was doing. So I was like, yeah, that's not going to fly. So I did what yeah. I did. It's, you know, it's, it's just interesting to me, all of these guys, you know, they, they, they act like they want a conversation, they act like they want to, to hash this out, and that they're only after the science. And then it's really, it's really telling how every single time you, you give them the material, your, your sources, that's, that's backing up what you're saying. And I'm saying this in relation to your, your stuff with Jim Kerr, but in my own experience as well, um, they never read it. They, they never read it. You know, I mean, it's not like, or they pretend to. Yeah, I mean, they'll yeah, they'll pretend to, right? Or they'll they'll yeah. throw off some some you know half half caught claim about the abstract, right. you know. And God, well, it, what, what's interesting is in the case of James is what he'll do the precise opposite is he'll flex by diving into the supplementals and go mm -hmm. see Dave. You don't read the supplementals, but then he'll just either lie about it or just botch it completely. Like he'll try to interpret an NMR spectrum and just like get it wrong. And his his fans are like, he's so smart. He's the best chemist and he's the best scientist in the whole world. And I was like, dude, he can't even read a carbon NMR spectrum. He can't even read this thing. Like he does he doesn't he doesn't even know that basaltic rock contains magnesium. He's complaining about oh Benner's washing off the magnesium. The the glass has magnesium in it, you idiot. Like it's, it's <laughs> so it's so telling too, because like, you know, I I'm, I'm getting, I'm around a lot of people with PhDs these days, and I don't know a single one of them that would speak that confidently. I know. About a field that's adjacent to their own, yeah. let alone one that is several fields over. And that that's the narcissism. That's the narcissism. He really thinks that. he's like the, the genius of the world. He really thinks that he can understand this stuff just magically, just because he, just because he wants to, you know. But uh, I got to add to something that, that Erica just said. I mean, I was on an expedition. Uh, one of the big, one of the highlights of my life was that I, I spent a couple of weeks on a paleontological expedition in South Africa in the Karoo, and I was with ten other guys on their invitation, uh, who all ha all had the name Professor Blankety Blank PhD, and I was delighted that they were that not only that they invited me you know, lowly YouTuber to, to be there as the, their videographer, but also that they treated me as an associate, which was just astounding. But when I was talking, when I was, I was in the field, I was talking to a geologist and it, that's his profession. He's a geologist. All the paleontologists are outside of earshot, you know, but I asked this paleontologist or I asked this geologist about how they date the area that the strata that we're standing on right now, he refused to answer. I know that he knows the answer. 
but he won't give it because he knows that there are people more expert than him that by the end of the day, I could get their input instead. Mm. I asked someone uh, in, you know, I asked a, a, someone who I'm, I'm in contact with, a, a PhD, maybe, maybe not in my department about their opinion on a paper that had come out on um, uh, mandibular diversity and hominids. He goes, no, 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 I don't do mandibles. I do teeth. Right, <laughs> he won't talk about the mandibles. Yeah, where the teeth sit, because he's like, I don't want to step on any toes. You know, I have my thoughts, but at the same time, and it's like, yeah, I mean, that's that's is that not the point of specialization, right? You right. have a broad scope of knowledge, but when there's someone who may be better to ask, that's that's who you go to, because no one can be an expert in anything, right? Well, no or one, they can be an expert in one thing, right? You yeah, can, yeah, you can be. Oh, I said I said anything. In I anything, meant everything. Yeah. yeah, no one can be in that. everything, right? Everything, right? You can you so you specialize and you rely yeah. on others. It's that's why we have experts, right? right. So for 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 people who fall for apologists, the scientists who who are who are explaining evolution and all the things that they don't want to understand, they're worthless. But then the one scientist they latch onto must be brilliant in all fields, right? That's right pretty much how these guys operate. Right. I, I want to address this question because I think it's going to put us back on the, the, the some of the challenging questions against, uh, well, supposedly against evolution. And I think this one is a uh, William Dembski, uh, one of the co-founders of the, um, the intelligent design back in the day in the 90s. And I think he's a, he used to be a computer scientist and calculated like a ridiculous number of the, because it's all, always, the conversation always to do about the chance of this is happening is so remote that must have a designer and has calculated Scary numbers. <laughs> yeah, something okay. to the power. Let me, let me just jump in. If I, I know, I know that the other two are going to have answers to this, but I mean, what we're what they're talking about is the argument from improbability fallacy. Mm. The first problem with that is that they don't understand that these are deterministic processes. So the, the evolution is not completely unguided. There's this thing called natural selection which means that certain you know, advantageous mutations are going to be favored and so forth. So you're going to get better adaptations down the road, right? So, uh, th that's, that's, that's the first part of it. But they don't, they don't understand that there are these processes at work. So they think that everything is just a roll of the dice. And so you have to roll the dice so many times and come up with the right number all the time. I don't know if it's deliberate. I don't know if it's insane. I don't know if it's dishonest. I don't know if it's all of the above, but it's not smart in any case. Yeah, more so, though, it's this kind of co coded language, ironically. But um, they, they, this, this whole subfield of apologetics where they're talking about it's a code, like a computer code. And you, we all know that, that humans make computer codes. So there has to be a god that made the computer code. It's, it's a total non-starter. It doesn't mean anything. Like this whole thing of like information is a substance. Where did the information come? It's just a sequence of nucleotides. Right. Information is just a pattern that we observe in matter. You can get information. You can take a, 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 a collection of molecules in the gas phase and give every every single one of them a, a, a vector, a momentum vector. That's information. It's just it's just it's atoms or molecules float flying around at random. You can assign a set of information to that state. It does. It, it's it. It doesn't mean anything. Right. It, we're talking about a sequence, a sequence of nucleotides. If there is a mechanism by which nu nucleic acids can form, they will have some sequence of nucleotides. That's the information. That's it. There's, there's nothing yeah. else to talk about here. I, don't I, I feel, Dave, there is a conflation between words like randomness, chance and impossible because to my understanding random there's something nothing magical about a random number it's still the set is defined and it's just a rotation and an alteration of the of the sequences to come up with different formats of it but it's it's it, it's within uh, the defined set of numbers that, that exist and therefore it, inevitably it is going to happen at some point when you keep alternating all these different options so there's nothing magical about this mm -mm. Yeah, it's just a bunch of different sequences, some of which resulted in uh, the production of interesting proteins that had a novel function. And then those sequences are selected for. That's that's it. So there is not there's nothing impossible about. What about do you think panspermia uh, could be a thing that the fact that the the first cells or the first uh, uh, precursors of life have come out of space? Nothing supernatural here. It could have happened. Well, no, no, we, we got to clarify what panspermia means. I mean, so the, yeah. so all of the uh, all of the basic chemical components have been found in meteorites. 
That doesn't mean that life was found in meteorites. And it doesn't mean that life was necessarily brought here from another place, which is what you know, the idea of panspermia basically is about. Mm -hmm. So everything that is in the, the origin of life studies, all of that could have occurred here. Yes, it can occur in space, and it has obviously occurred in space, but it didn't need to. It, it can all happen here. Well, not all of it. I mean, uh, the, yeah, the basic building blocks are found in space. So, yes, yeah. that's obviously true. So the ingredients I, and then the, the pie got baked on Earth. I, I think, well, another option, though, is uh, is uh, because it is definitely possible for, for an impact to strike another body in the solar system. Like, let's say Mars, the rudimentary life was brewing on Mars. You get an impact and some biological material gets delivered from Mars to Earth. Right. Mm -hmm. That's actually I was writing uh, a pilot for science. I shouldn't have said that. That was an idea I had for a science fiction. Never mind. I didn't say that. But uh, anyway, that that is more, I think, akin to I, I don't think panspermia people are, are implying that life literally formed in the vacuum of space where that would be too much. Although the basic biomolecules certainly are. But but at any rate, I mean, I don't like like Arn said, I don't subscribe to panspermia. It's not it's not needed. Right. Uh, we're, we're elucidating all the mechanisms by which life could, could have arisen on earth right you just need water and molecules i think so. i think too um regarding that earlier stuff with the code i, I was looking it up because i couldn't remember the video but um john perry of stated casually and stated clearly has an excellent video on signaling theory um which goes over how not only how do you get you know information as we understand it right or as we assign it rather but how do you get these communication systems quote unquote you know that that lead to um, transcription, translation, protein synthesis, DNA replication, all of these important things that are vital for much more advanced life than we're talking about at the abiogenesis stage. Um, and he's got a great, great lit review in there that, that I thought was very helpful. And just as a, to tag it on, you know, all of this boils down to like the incredulity of how do you get such complex relationships? Okay, I don't know a single young earth creationist or creationist or, you know, pseudoscientist in general who you know, wouldn't look at an ecosystem and say that an ecosystem forms naturally, right? And of course it does, because we see this happen with primary and secondary succession when a new area sort of goes back to, is reclaimed by nature or what have you. And the relationships involved in an ecosystem are incredibly complex and interdependent, uh, and yet they do form. And these these different parts of it are, are reliant on one another. Um, there are plenty of different complex sort of systems that we see in nature that we observe forming today and we have a really nice scaffold for understanding how that happened in the past as well with regard to, to you know, yeah that's actually so a really we're... good point though just to i mean i i actually i haven't even thought of that kind of example because what you're saying is they're accepting that 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 all those complex interrelationships arose naturally and yet if you removed say one key species from that it food web apart. it would all fall apart it falls apart that's a good one i'm going to use that mm, hey all yours <laughs> yeah the, I mean, to me, all of these sort of um, um, analogies are very much like a William Paley type of analogy. It's teleological, it's argument from design. Uh, it's the Boeing 747 emerging out of a, a garage after a tornado, which is the silliest thing I've ever heard. Um, and, and it just keeps rotating around that. It's like, you know, life is so complex. It looks like a, I mean, I think the funniest one was Ray Comfort's, um, almost like a felt almost like an oral education about oral sex, holding a banana and, and telling, you know, how the bananas curve to exactly fit their hand. Uh, not even knowing the banana that we're eating today has been artificially selected. Bananas are not even yeah, like that. So <laughs> God, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's vintage Ray Comfort. That's, yeah, that's not just bananas. Like Pretty much everything in the produce section. I actually had to tell somebody that today. They were like, oh, all this perfect fruit. And dude, we invented all of this. We made all of it. And the meat too. I mean, go past the produce section. That's also us, right? Yeah. Like selecting for that yeah. kind of meat, the marbling yes. steak is is decades of selection. So. Yeah. Well, Derek Lambert is in the house, so a good friend of mine, and I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with with, with um, yes Derek, and he's asking whether he wants to catch up with you guys at some point and saying yeah. hello to everyone. Derek, I, I want to talk soon. I'm I'm bad about communicating right now because I'm getting absolutely slammed in my my IRL stuff. But yes, I would love to to chat again to soon about whatever. I'm just, just gotta find a time. Where, where where are you at in your PhD course at the moment, um, Erica? You're so I'm at the end of year two. I'm about to start my comps. So I'm done. I, I'm almost done with coursework. I'm I'm 
very close. I've got one more class that I, I want to, I could finish this semester with my coursework, but I'm trying to save it because there's a gross anatomy class that's offered that I really want to take um, that'll get me like partially accredited to teach anatomy. So right. that's a nice backup to have. So I'm, I'm kind of pushing, pushing off finishing my cor my coursework with regard to that, but that'll take my comps. And then after I pass my comps and pitch my dissertation, I'll be ABB and then I'll have to do my dissertation. The easiest step of the PhD. Talk and then I'll be able to say that that doctor got sick given. There you go. Me yeah. for references. Hey, there you go. Yeah, you'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to my my, my doctorate holder. And, and of course, Aaron, you you've recently got your paleontology uh, degree as well. I did. It took forever because I was I'm a family man, struggling yeah. work, you know, a working class kind of guy, and it took forever to do that. It was only of May this year. I've been in class. I've been taking classes toward this degree for almost 20 years wow. in my spare time. Wow. But I, I finally got it. When oh, I was lots of respect for that, you know, pursuing, pursuing knowledge to the very end. But uh, unfortunately, you know, like, did you find that most of the stuff, stuff you're studying for, you kind of knew through your own efforts and you just have to have the degree because that's, that's the world we're I, I don't want to be arrogant about that because i got something useful all out of almost every class you know when you take a degree plan they want you to take a bunch of other classes that you think are unrelated to what you're going to study but you'd be surprised mm -hmm. in, in my field i was surprised at how much relevance all of this other stuff had i mean i'm reading stuff from from uh, uh, 13th century japan and I'm finding that it's relevant to what I'm studying now. So, I mean, there was an awful lot of that. The only class I didn't like was the, the only thing class I didn't get anything out of was sociology. That's that, that was the only class that was like, yeah, I didn't need this one. And it turned out I literally didn't need this one because I'd already taken uh, philosophy earlier and completely forgotten that I had taken that class. <laughs> <laughs> And Dave, of course, you've given up um, a career almost in teaching, but you still ended up being a teacher, but in a different type of realm. Oh, I didn't give anything up. I did not want to be a teacher. <laughs> that was just, you know, you got to make money, right? Ah. Somehow, everybody's got to make money. Yeah. But, Can you uh, imagine, Dave, if you were a teacher? Instead my, of a... my wife was a professional middle school teacher. Right. It was bad mm -hmm. in Texas. Yeah, I mean, I don't like. I, I liked it all right, especially teaching OCHEM at uh, at a university because it was adults, and so they were eager to learn and appreciated that I could explain it well. Um, but no, I just I wanted to be a musician. I still just want to be a musician, but uh, you got to make money. And uh, I'm I, I I mean, I don't know what I would be doing right now if I hadn't uh, stumbled upon YouTube. I mean, this has definitely changed changed a lot of things for me in a, in a great way so you're, you're helping a lot of people dave you're helping a lot of people uh and so th you're definitely adding value to this uh miserable universe that we're living in but uh, <laughs> we're, we're we're back on track on evolution now and i've got a, a challenging question to the panel and this is what this one here i hear a lot from muslims um uh, there is something significant in the quran talks about the creation of everything uh, in, in male and female forms, because this is the order of the word. Obviously, now that we know better, we know that the, the word male, female is an emergent property uh, and, are, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, an advanced area in the evolution of uh, reproduction, because this is not how things uh, started. So they have Try a problem. explaining emergence to a creation. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, we're not confused. But they, they, they go, how did the male and female separately evolve at the same time to be able to mate and have intercourse? <laughs> the same what species evolved that, twice, but in two forms. <laughs> what I loved about that was about the way Ray Comfort distorted that uh, when he was on the 700 Club talking to... to uh, Oh, fuck. I, I can't remember his name. The guy who was always wrong about everything, but that doesn't that didn't really narrow it down, does it? Yeah, he was on the 700. <laughs> and he says, well, let's pretend I'm an evolutionist. And, and there's a big bang and evolution begins or life begins because th those two are directly related. They're not separated by 10 yeah. billion years. An right? So there's a big bang a and life graphic. begins. Yeah. Right. And then suddenly a dog evolves. It's got eyes, legs and a tail. Right. So what is he thinking about a lump of hamburger sat around for millions of years and suddenly developed eyes, legs and a tail? 
And then it had to go look for a female dog because, you know, the male is also is always the basis of the species. Right. So this lump of hamburger sat around for millions of years, suddenly grew eyes, legs and a tail and went looking around for another cocker spaniel to go breed with. Right. And it was there, too. Yeah. Mm. Now, this guy has been arguing on on the beach for 20 some odd years, made millions of dollars. He has a two story beach house in Malibu by telling this fucking lie. I get it. I'd be out there. If I didn't have ethics, I'd be out there telling the same lies he is just yeah. to make that kind of money. But he knows. He knows that, that that what he's talking about is a complete straw man, that this is not evolution, that, that we don't believe there was ever an, a, a lump of hamburger that became a male dog. But this is what blows my mind is like there are so, so, so many species, including so, so, so many animals that are hermaphroditic. Yes. Right. They 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 have they're male and female. And they right. And so it's very clear that that the, the sexual reproduction arose and then there was a divergence. Right. There's the sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism was a, was an adaptation. Right. Sexual dimorphism evolved after this concept of the male and female gonads. It's not that hard to understand. There's like flatworms and things that are alive right now that that reproduce this way. They're hermaphrodites. And and populations evolve, right? It's not one individual is the first male right. and the second individual is the first female no. and then they, you know, go get busy, right? Like populations. So, so reproduction as making exact copies of yourself is always going to be vulnerable to certain things because once you attack a population, uh, with, with, let's say a virus or a bacteria or whatever, uh, if this population is exactly identical, then it's, it's quite, it's quite easy to annihilate. But if you end up with a situation where 50% uh, of the DNA is shared between male and female, you end up with uh, copying errors that will lead to mutations and variations in, 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 uh, in, in species that will end up with... I mean, even outside just of mutations, recombination shuffles. Right. Greater <laughs> genetic variety, very yeah. more, much more rapidly, yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, look, obviously sexual reproduction evolved... And so you have what we now consider the male and female gametes, and then that diverged such that male was expressed in half the half the population of that species, female expressed in half the population of that, that, that species. The genetic information for both types of gametes are there in every single organism. It's just about how they're expressed. Hmm. Right. I mean we, we also have to throw out the important thing that that there are species, there are even vertebrate species that can switch back and forth between sexual yes. and asexual yep. reproduction. And that there are, there, there are asexual microbes that have most or if not all of the capacity for sexual reproduction. They just don't use it because they don't need to. Hmm. Yes, because se sexual reproduction is quite taxing, isn't it? it? It requires a lot of energy. A lot of people say, well, uh, sexual reproductions and things like the brain uh, evolving is a little bit of a, a taxing situation because these are very energy hungry, uh, the uh, mechanics. Well, there's the energy, there's the energy in the actual mating, but then there's also competing with other individuals. There's, they're seeking out viable individuals, right? These competition plays such a massive role when, when you get sort of high, you know, in certain areas of, of multicellular life, competition is just the name of the game, right? And, and when you've got organisms that are social, that gets dialed up to 11. All right, G guys, we're, we're uh, getting into the last half an hour of the conversation, so feel free I've to I've got to throw in something right now. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, because somebody, you had posted when you were advertising this thing, you said that the evolution is a fact. And somebody wanted to say, and I've, I've heard this apologetics argument a number of times, that this is a bait and switch thing, that we would show proof of microevolution and then use that as evidence of macroevolution. Mm -hmm. And I would like Erica and, and Dave to help me with, with explaining what the ba if you could understand the basis of micro evolution, macro evolution is a foregone conclusion. That's an inevitability. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so, I mean, micro micro evolution, right? We're, we're talking about changes within a species. And when we say changes with change within a species, uh, change in allelic frequencies over time, you know, mutations, variation. Um, we're talking about the mechanisms at play in normal everyday evolutionary mechanisms. You got genetic drift, you've got gene flow. Um, so you get enough of those that accumulate, right? And it's going to get us, you're going to get speciation. It, as, as Dave and Aaron both said earlier in different ways, this is an inevitability, right? Because variation will always exist because of the nature of, of reproduction, the nature of division, cell division, and the nature of, um, of mutations, right? That variation will always exist and variation will always 
be selected for in different ways in different environments because there will be differential reproductive success, success excuse me. Um, so, you know, organisms that have a characteristic that makes them more fit, even if it's a percentage of a percentage point, are going to differentially reproduce uh, at a greater rate as compared to another individual in their population, right? Microevolution, sure. And let it happen long enough and, and speciation just happens. Yeah. I mean, microevolution pouring water in a cup right right like, the, the people who think who accept microevolution and not macroevolution are saying oh i can fill up uh, a cup of water from this faucet but not a swimming pool right? yeah it's wait a while it's, it's fill an it up. simulation right i mean yeah. and, and these kinds of people right they, they do accept speciation right it's just the you know we we always come back around to the same conversation well it's still a dog well it's still a fly well it's a, and then you realize that there's a lot more to talk about than just the difference between microevolution and macroevolution with this particular individual. Uh, right. You got to start a lot lower. Right. Because here's the problem. Microevolution can be observed rapidly. It can be observed directly, whereas macroevolution takes a while. So you, in order to demonstrate that macroevolution has occurred, you have to go into the past because we can look sure. a long time in the past. And so what I like to do is I, I like to ask these people if they understand that we are a mammal. Yeah. Because most people will accept that we are a mammal, not understanding what the rest of the ramifications yeah. are of that are. Mm -hmm. I could start with animal. Do you think we are an animal? And then I have to bring up Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21, which, you know, you know as well as any dictionary, which would prove that we are an animal. But yeah, they, well, they want to draw some line of distinction. And they, they reject that they're a primate. So I have to give the definition of a primate. And of course, they don't accept any taxonomic class except maybe vertebrate. That's the only one that, okay, well, yeah, I have a backbone. But that don't mean I'm Which an animal. They usually don't. That's the irony. <laughs> They're pretty spineless. We, well, weirdly, weirdly, I've had more success with, with getting people to be okay with being a mammal than an animal, right? Like, not knowing, of course, that it, <laughs> mammal is a class. It's more specific by agreeing to that. Yeah. You're agreeing to everything, you know, taxonomically above it. But, yeah. you know, again, there are greater problems at play. Well, if you're going to get your taxonomy from the Bible, then bats are birds and so <laughs> Sure. I and mean, lobsters you know, are fish. And so are whales. <laughs> yeah, and so are whales, right. Yeah, sea turtles are fish, but tortoises are not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really, really. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot going on here as well with with this desire for human exceptionalism, right? Like that people want so badly to be set apart from everything else, to be something that is wholly unique um, and not like everything else. And and whether that's because they just want to be special or because it absolves them of responsibility for you know other life on this earth, I don't really know. I think it's probably a little bit of both. But you know, I I study primates, I study extant primates and extinct primates, and I have a very difficult time coming up with, with anything that categorically separates humans uh, from the rest of the animal kingdom. Yeah, it's seriously. so dumb, though, because we are super special. We are the most super special primate. We are the most super special animal. Look at what we're doing. We are Yay! super special, but we're also all those things. Like, what's the problem? Well, and, and speaking, I would of argue... special, speaking of special, I'm seeing in the comments that whoever's pretending to be Matt Powell official is uh, uh, arguing with Neil, the 604 atheist. Hey, would you like to talk about evolution? Yeah. Talk to Neil about, don't talk about it. Talk, don't talk about that to any of the three people on the panel here. Cause you know, who's going to walk away butthurt from that. Right. <laughs> it's just going to turn into another biology lesson. Right. Cause I mean, it, it always becomes so elucidating on like the background that in the, uh, that a lot of these folks have in it. And like, there's nothing wrong with not being, you know, supremely well-educated in a topic as long as you're willing to learn about it. There's plenty of things that I don't know, know shit about, but if I don't know it, I'm not going to come up with three people who do and say and it's start fake. trying to teach them about it. Right. Yeah. That that's where the disconnect is. I'll, can you I'll imagine can you go imagine ahead, not ahead, knowing? Don. Can you imagine not knowing something very, very thoroughly, and just professing that this is going to be your opinion, and that no one can change your mind? No, I'd be so embarrassed. You know, I'd be, I'd be mortified because the second someone proved me wrong, I'd look like a big idiot. <laughs> oh, they don't, they don't, don't they don't care for that. They don't care for that. I've got two, two challenging questions before we get into the last half an hour where people can start asking their questions. Um, it's going to be. Um, Q&A uh, type of um, format, but um, the first question is, uh, we say birds, especially I think uh, 
the T. Rex is, um, is one uh, one ancestor of all birds that we have right now. Uh, if 63 million years ago all dinosaurs were extinct, how do we have birds who have the um, the uh, um, ancestry of of dinosaurs that were extinct some 63 million years ago? Well, birds birds appeared before 63 million years ago, uh, or 65 million years ago, if we're talking about when dinosaurs went extinct. I mean, we had birds, I believe, in the Jurassic. I mean, it, yep. birds that would have looked very familiar, although they would probably open their mouth and they would still have teeth. Um, or they might have, you know, in some of the... In, in and they still had unfused more. wing fingers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so claw-tipped claw wings, as it were, colloquially. So they, they would look familiar, but it, it isn't from, you know, the dinosaurs, that your big theropod non-avian dinosaurs that modern birds descend, at least not the ones that lived at the Cretaceous. Um, right. Probably something significantly earlier, early Jurassic, late Triassic. We're talking about um, a sort of archosaur-looking critter. So uh, not like all birds. Not all, not all birds are the uh, the offspring of dinosaurs, but some are. Like apparently, chicken. no, no, all birds. Yeah, all, all birds, all birds are, are 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 literally living dinosaurs. Living They're the dinosaurs. last lineage of dinosaurs. So what happened was, what happened was, what happened was what, yeah. birds emerged before the end of the Mesozoic era in in the mid Jurassic. There was a lineage of dinosaurs that we recognize now as birds. Most of them had the ability to fly, and this apparently aided them when the shit hit the fan and killed all of the other dinosaurs that were massive, that required huge dietary intake and all of that, and birds were able to fly from one, one tr you know, tragic uh, in environment to another to, to skirt complete destruction. And most of the lines of birds in the Cretaceous went extinct also only two lineages survived so there were several that went extinct along with the rest of the dinosaurs only two lineages of birds the paonese and the, the paonese and neonate no excuse me paonese and neonates were the were the only ones to survive and from the paleonase we get ostriches and emus and cassowaries and that sort of thing and then nice. and then we have all of the other modern birds which begin ironically with chickens and ducks Right. Yeah, you know, it, it, a lot of people don't appreciate this, and I didn't for a very long time, but there was quite a bit of mammal diversity going on during the Mesozoic, during the tail end of the Mesozoic, um, and even a little bit at the end of the middle, um, sort of at the end of the Jurassic, we had a lot of different types of mammals. They were just all very small. In fact, they were really, really good at being small. That's that's something that, that was brought to my attention. I just read um, the, the Rise and Reign of the Mammals, which is really good to kind of you know, layman book that I found very helpful for, for talking about mammals, but hordes of mammals went extinct at the, at the end of the Cretaceous. Multituberculates got absolutely annihilated. A lot of our marsupials were destroyed. I mean, the ones that made it through, made it through through a combination of chance and lifestyle. Um, it seems as though there was a really big bias towards burrowers. And it seems as that kind of went for the birds as well. It, correct me if I'm wrong, Arne, because you might know the bird evolution a little bit better than I do, but if memory serves, it was it was riverside burrowers, not unlike some of the, the aquatic the waterfowl that we have today. You know, birds that are living in, you know, slightly underground in these little burrows on the sides of rivers and the same goes for mammals that managed to make it through. And this might've shielded them, one, from the massive just catastrophe that befell the earth for you know, the days and weeks following the initial impact, we're talking about heating the air, to, like globally speaking, like pretty high for a couple hours immediately after the the, the uh, bolide impact. But also, these guys would have thrived on insects, which are really really hardy. You can't survive on insects if you're if you're big, like if you're huge, unless you're you're eating things like um, hymenopterans, like sort of colonial insects that are all found in one place. Everybody made it through with small burrowing. And lucky, I would say. Yeah. So Hesperornis is one lineage of birds that went away in the Cretaceous. They 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 survived on fish. They were imagine a six foot penguin uh, kind of a thing, except that they were really good at swimming. I mean, differently than penguins were. But there's but suddenly there's no fish because the the oceans have experienced this you know, this huge travesty. So they're they're all gone. And you often hear the thing that nothing with a body weight more than 40 pounds survived that age. That's not entirely true. Crocodiles did. Yeah. But crocodiles, crocodiles had a couple of advantages. 
because they are exactly on the opposite end of the scale from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were the hypervelocity, supercharged, high-tuned sports models. They were pound per pound quicker, faster, and stronger than mammals of the same way, just hands down. But because of that, when they go on dire times and they don't have the, they, they don't, they, they can't find the sustenance to maintain those hyperactive bodies, they died out. Whereas crocodiles can eat once a month. Uh -huh and still be okay. And then crocodiles also bury their eggs. So crocodilians, their eggs being buried, even if all the crocodiles died, their eggs would still hatch and the crocodilians would come out and they'd still survive to the next generation. So th that, that, that's what happened with a lot of these. It, it was just a lucky happenstance of the type of design. Why did turtles live? They bury their eggs. Why did crocodiles live? They bury their eggs. And very few things that had a, 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 high octane diet were able to survive unless they were really tiny. I think, I think you could make a good argument, like a good analogy like this. Like let's say there was a big catastrophe today that annihilated, you know, pretty much all of the, the family Canadae, except for red foxes, for whatever reason, let's say red foxes make it through. And in, you know, 30 million years, red foxes are like, they've evolved into these big tanky looking, you know, almost hyenodont looking guys. And people look at those and, and they, they say, ah, you know, these these are the last of the canids, right? Like, why why did they survive and, and others didn't? You know, it, it, talking about the relationship with the dinosaurs and the birds, this thing is still a canid, right? It may not look like the other canids that lived, you know, 30 million years before it when everything went extinct, but it's still a canid. And its ancestor lived at the same time of all those other canids. It just so happened that this particular canid made it through the adaptations that it underwent afterwards are sort of of no consequence to what it was in its relationship with the other back then. Yeah. That's where we're at at bird, with birds right now. So um, what I'm trying to get at is, is, is with, with the five great extinctions, uh, that there isn't really a, a total annihilation. There always, maybe in G Jeff Goldblum's voice, life finds a way. <laughs> oh, you got close in the Permian. We got close. We're talking a hair's breadth away from complete sterilization during the Permian, uh, it's not complete sterilization of multicellular life, let's say. Um, it Whoever is whoever is pretending to be Matt Powell, I'm seeing in the chat, and I realize there's a bit of delay, so this was probably two or three minutes ago, but whoever is pretending to be Matt Powell here, it just challenged me to show one evidence for evolution because they don't they, they never know how to to count I mean, evidence they always say evidence says evidence right right have so you been listening know, for you know, the past hour and a half what are you doing why are you even yeah. here what are you doing <laughs> yeah, one, i think you might be an imposter at this point yeah. yeah well no i thought it was an imposter right away because why would matt powell want to humiliate himself in this panel but <laughs> if on the on the off chance that that's that's the real ginger twink in the in our chat room then <laughs> I, I would love to have him contact me. He knows how to do that. I would love to have a one-on-one a -on -one video discussion with him so that I can give him uh, a couple dozen solid evidences <laughs> for evolution that he can't contest because he doesn't know fucking anything. Um, now, uh, one last challenging question before I go back to the super chat, and there is one interesting one here coming about uh, the uh, blood groups and stuff like that. Uh, uh, the Camprian explosion. Uh, a lot of people say, what, what, what happened 700 million years ago that gave rise to all these mammals? Uh, and beforehand, there was like, there's nothing. Yeah. Isn't this the, uh, the point of, it looks like it's the moment of creation that the Bible is talking about, because... You know, uh, they obviously, they don't understand the oxygen dilemma. And I'll get Dave uh, here to comment on this first one, because uh, I think chemistry here has a bit of a, a very helping hand with the abundance of oxygen uh, emerging. Uh, and if, is it the blue-green algae um, that started to, to breathe oxygen out into the atmosphere? But what happened in that era that give rise to the the, the myriads of, uh, of species of uh, I don't know the exact correlation. I know that number one, that photosynthetic algae evolved and then that oxygenated the oxygenated the atmosphere. And then you had a whole new way of, of, uh, of going about meta metabolism. Um, and then obviously I know that the, uh, Cambrian explosion occurred. I don't know exactly temporally how those correlate. Um, but I did do a very, very lengthy debunk of Stephen Meyer that talked about the Cambrian explosion for about an hour. 
um, and sh- and showed how everything they say is ridiculous. Uh, the number one thing being that they tried to, first of all, they they call they they exploit this term explosion as if to pretend it was instantaneous, whereas yeah. even they even they uh, refer to it as a period of ten million years, which is a lie. It's like seventy or eighty million years. Uh, and furthermore, it's it's kind of the more you look at it, not actually really an explosion. There is there is a strong continuum. Uh, first of all, it is not the emergence of of all of these phyla in the Ediacaran period that precedes it. Uh, many of these body plans emerge and then go seamlessly into that period that is referred to as the Cambrian explosion. You and also then, had then you not after. every phylum, not every phylum appeared in the Cambrian. Two phylum were already extinct before the Cambrian explosion began, and another one didn't pop up until the very end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just all, it, it is a lot of new forms uh, 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 arising, uh, mainly, I think, due to uh, 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 the novel phenomenon of predation. You kind of just, it's sort of the first time that you have predation, which is a very strong driver of, of evolution, right? If you have animals that are now eating each other. Licks of the rates, yeah. Yeah. Licks the rates and things, yeah. So it's going to go so lightning fast, you guys, 50 million years, so crazy fast that all these uh things arise you know but um yeah that one oh god the cambrian explosion one also annoys me because there yes it is absolutely true that we have predecessor forms in ediacaran and you know well in deep into the ediacaran like early into the ediacaran for a lot of the stuff that we see in the cambrian but like also like let's just think about this for a second from like they love their common sense so let's think about this for a second from a common sense standpoint um, if the Cambrian is when we see the, the origination of like hard chitinous body parts, before that, there aren't hard chitinous body parts. Everything is relatively soft bodied. Now, I challenge you make a couple of jello cups and throw them out into your backyard, and then take a couple of chicken wing bones and throw them out there, which is going to be more likely to survive two weeks down the road. It's going to be the hard body parts, right? Organisms that have soft bodies, things like jellyfish, things like soft-bodied worms, they're not as likely to fossilize because they decompose fast. There's nothing even to preserve, you know, which is why a lot of the life that we have in Ediacaran, not all of it, but a lot of it, we have preserved in sort of um, uh, secondary style fossils, right? Burrows and tracks and things of that nature. Yeah, um, other types that's, of evidence. Pardon me? Yeah, other types of evidence. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get, yeah, going exactly. all the way back to the earliest forms of sponges and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we get stromatolites from 3.8 million years. Well, I don't know if that's stromatolite quite then, but very old, from billion of year old stromatolites, so amazing mm-hmm. bacterial mass. But like, guys, this is this is really easy stuff. And if evolution predicts that at some point, just call it an arbitrary point in time, hard body parts emerge, those organisms are going to basically be preferentially put into the fossil work fossil record over the soft-bodied organisms that came before them just by the nature of their chemical makeup mm-hmm. and i that that's really all there is all there is to it i think the cambrian explosion is a massive biodiversification event i think it's drastically exaggerated because of a sampling bias because of a taphonomic sampling bias i actually kind of agree with this so you, you reckon that life was just was as rich beforehand but the, the nature of animals then did not help the fossilization process. And therefore, we think it was scarce or poorer then. I think, I, think, I think it's not. I wouldn't say it's as rich in the Adiacra, and I really wouldn't. But I would say that we, we see biodiversity, you know, kind of explode as multicellularity explodes. And, and as the pressures uh, in the sea diversify, as organisms sort of take their own pathways and their own niches. But what I would say is that absolutely we're seeing a, a, a taphonomic bias prior to the Cambrian explosion that makes it look more immediate than it actually was. Yeah. So do you think oxygen, I think oxygen was told to, uh, it was almost got to the closest possible ratio that we have right now, which is, uh, I think about 21%. Do you think oxygen here played a role? Do you think these animals have thrived because of the abundance of oxygen? I mean, I, I, I've heard it argued before that organisms that that are utilizing oxygen right are they have a faster metabolism which allows them to move faster, reproduce faster, and all that all that sort of thing. And when I say faster metabolism, I mean as opposed to much simpler multicellular or maybe even single cellular life that um, you know sort of makes its living chemosynthetically or or whatever. 
Um, oxygen does add another um, sort of variable to that mix and allows organisms to get bigger um, and, and utilize energy in different ways. I don't know though, like th that's not really, that's not really my field. I can relate to the taphonomy because that's relevant to today as well. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure how large of a role oxygen played. I would be surprised. I would be shocked if it was none. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it might've contributed to some degree, but there might be other things at play here that we, um, we discovered. It seems to always be the, any situation is a bit nuanced. There's a lot more to contribute to any situation. Well, I, yeah, I know bioturbidation was huge, right? So like just the burrowing activity of a lot of organisms prior to the Cambrian impacted greatly the types of organisms that took hold in the Cambrian and beyond. Sessile critters, like if all of their food, which is effectively like a, just a mat on the on the ocean floor is getting tossed up because this is really what they're called, priapolita, the penis one, because they're burrowing so much and tossing all of this stuff, mixing it into the seawater. Uh, they can't survive because they can't chase their food. They're all sessile. So yeah, I mean, they're... Uh, Everything is going in there, especially in the early in the early stages of biodiversity. Every little thing, every little variable that you add to the mix is going to, to push and nudge organisms in new and exciting ways. Do you think the transition from ectotherms to homeotherms at some point, and, and as you know, uh, pound for pound, a homeotherm will probably need to eat about 10 times more. Uh, uh, Aaron just brought up the example of a crocodile. Uh, once a month and, and, it, and, it, and it's done it, it, for food, it, it, it's okay. But for a homeotherm, for metabolism, uh, they'll need to eat a lot more. And therefore, with predation starting, there's a lot more competition and everything suddenly is accelerated. Everything has got to be faster. I, there's no way it's a coincidence that that a lot of our sort of warm-blooded, as it were, animals show up in times of like great bounty you know, in the fossil record, like they don't, they don't show up for the first time when times are hard terrestrially, they show up when things are established, because you're right, like, if you've got a power, you know, a, a, a big body that that's moving fast and eating a lot and reproducing often, you need a lot of, of food to supply that. And, you know, you see this a second time with with the emergence of large brains in primates, and then again, larger brains in apes, and again, the larger apes and hominids, these are times of, of plenty that these things can show up because there's available resources for it. Mm -hmm. The person that was posting in the chat under the name of Matt Powell official, I now kind of believe that it probably is Matt Powell because right. I saw a few minutes ago, he said that, do you believe you descended from broccoli? That is a Matt Paul Powell. Uh, broccoli. Yeah, because it's a not thing that possible. we invented it's like not, 200 years ago. <laughs> yeah. It's not possible to be that stupid if you're naturally stupid, you have to be dishonest as well. And you have to be dishonest primarily. So I think for that reason, I think that really is Matt Powell. What a coward. Why is he here heckling? Like, if you really want to have this conversation, just just email any of us. I'm sure any of us would be happy to, um, to offer Oh, conversation. I would have so much fun with him. <laughs> I like his choice of vegetable, though. He, he chooses a vegetable that we, a lot like, of people don't like very much. <laughs> the, no. Also, one of the most, probably the most recently cultivated <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> it's like there's like almost somebody alive today that's like, oh, I remember when they came out with broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> what an idiot. Uh, a question here, which is an interesting one. Actually, I don't know the answer. I'd love to know the answer. How does natural selection and evolution explain 15%? Not sure if. The, how accurate that number is. I'm, I'm going to ch chat GPT is in a second, which is a brilliant now that's going to replace Google. Um, uh, evolution explained 15% of the world's population having RH negative blood. So well, this first is of all, a natural selection isn't the only mechanism for evolution. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, yeah a genetic drift is actually more, I think, dominant. Especially in situations like this, where you're looking at certain percentages of a given trait, drift is really powerful with that. Um, and so is gene flow as far as like moving it around. Um, yeah, this, so I know where this talking point comes from. It, it comes from two different places. One, you have like the, um, the, the race realists like to utilize this one. And then there's another crowd that likes the RH negative, And it's usually the, the ancient aliens people. Both of them like it. It's been a really long time since I've talked about RH negative blood. Um, if memory serves, I mean, I know for a fact there's quite a bit of work on it. You can go on Google Scholar and look up the evolution of RH negative blood, and there are plenty of papers that that have um, explained this phenomena, as it were. Um, but like, 
even conceptually as RN said, right? Like you're talking about a percentage of the world's population having a given trait. That is like 101 stuff, right? It's <laughs> how does how does a percent of a population get a characteristic? Like we've been talking about that this entire show. So is this going to be something very similar to skin pigmentation? Well, so our, so the blood type stuff can be kind of weird just because you've got an interesting relationship, especially in utero, like with the blood type of the mother versus the blood type of, of the kid. There are some weird relationships with that. And then um, with the, the, the placental barrier, I can't exactly remember. what I, w I wish I could have had, I wish I could like look this up and take a minute because I know I've explained this before. I just don't remember the explanation because these guys only come out of the woodwork ever so often. I'm not even understand what is the problem. I mean, I have very vague. I barely even know what's being talked about. We're talking about a particular surface protein on a red blood cell that is not present, right? Is that what? It, what's the problem it's with like, that? Like Erica, I can barely remember the argument because it comes up so rarely. And like she pointed out, it's usually not creationists that bring this up. It's usually race realists. Yeah, that's yeah, or the alien people. It's one or the other. I yeah. I can't remember what the. I honestly can't even remember what the deal was. Like what I'm the just not up to speed on what they're what. I don't even, yeah, like I barely no really know. Cares. No. <laughs> yeah, no one really cares what they have to say, thank God. Yeah. But, well, some people do, which is not good. But Yeah, but, but to me, that, this is quite clear. I mean, there are, there, there are different factors yeah. that can affect uh, uh, those sort of traits in, in a certain characteristic in the group. And I agree here with, with Aaron that uh, genetic drift and genetic isolation can end up actually being the, the, the biggest contributor of, of that. That's why I call I call it skin pigmentation because um, in we know that certain people sort of living in, 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 a, in a different environment might end up with different characteristics um, uh, based on mostly on their ge geographical location and uh, the drift of that particular gene. So that could have been easily quite explained by genetic drift. I think. I'm actually, yeah, I'm looking at a paper right now that's it's titled Evolution and Genetics of the Human RH Blood Group System by Perry et al. from 2012, and it is pinning drift as the explanation for the yeah. blood group. That's what I think too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and it's quite interesting here. That, that brings up a very interesting question: that natural selection is not the only game in town. There, yeah. there seems to be some some tools and some mechanics. And some layers to, to the evolution is a fact, but the mechanics and the tools, we can discuss that and argue about which one is more effective in that particular situation. But it doesn't true? even have to be that. I mean, there could be a number of play at any given time. It's just that, you know, see, Darwin recognized natural selection and then also sexual selection as being different. Those were the first two mechanisms identified for evolution. And then there were a number of others. And the most important of those, in my, my opinion, is genetic drift because that doesn't necessarily have to have a selective pressure. That's when you have one, one parent organism divided into two areas. And this is the simple, there are many different types of speciation, but this is the simplest one to explain. When you have one parent organism that's divided into two different groups, say, you know, a river flows between them abruptly or whatever. Uh, and so over a certain number of generations, you start to notice that each individual, the West side and the East side, are visually distinct so that if you find an interloper in the no man's land between them you can tell which population it came from because of the traits it shares that's not a, that's not a selective pressure it has nothing to do with their ability to survive or to reproduce those are just the accumulations of of mutations that are going to naturally occur do you do you think i mean it's one of one of the challenges have been made is is uh, mutations are random and blind yeah, natural selection might be a little bit guided, but natural selection only act upon mutations, and mutations are so random and blind, and therefore it doesn't look like a design. Uh, there is a design whatsoever. Yeah, but now, the, the context isn't blind. That's that. That's what I was saying earlier, right? The context isn't blind. The mutations occur, and like you know, I use this exam this as an example in class. But there's a species of of ice fish that has antifreeze. It's an antifreeze protein in its blood. It's effectively keeps its blood from freezing. It's a de novo, de novo mutation in a protein because of a duplication in an ancestral population, right? If that mutation showed up in an equatorial population of red snapper fish, do you think it's going to be selected for? No, it, it's not. It, it could very well disappear with the, indiv the first individual it showed up with, right? 
It's context specific. And that's what gives the illusion of design because the environment molds the individual or not the individual, but the population, the individual species or the population. It's the puddle analogy. A puddle yeah. looks like it's perfectly formed for its hole because the puddle was formed within the hole, right? I mean- I'm reading some papers of late that they're actually argue, starting to argue that mutations is not as blind as what we think. Some of them looks like they might be guided. Yeah, I've so I saw that. I believe this was on some kind of wasn't it a flower? Weren't they doing it on some? Yeah, kind of, yeah. So there's actually some issues with that study. Um, if memory serves, there were some problems with the way that they accounted for some of the variables. It might not be as cut and dry as the researchers um, are making it seem. Regardless of whether it is or isn't, um, and I te- I'm on this. I tend to think that it is because I believe it was the researchers themselves who, who kind of discussed it. This is not this is not like proof of like guided evolution, I would say, Um, because the vast majority of mutations don't function that way. The vast majority of organisms do not have this. If it is in fact present in this one particular plant, they don't have this sort of, um, this sort of proofreading mechanism or whatever you might call it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Cause if if mutation at the end of the day is, is error in, in, in copying, um, then you wouldn't expect them to be guided because then more mutagens. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the other problem is that creationists, I mean, apart from them not knowing what a point mutation is, they, they also don't realize that point mutations are not the only mechanism of genome modification. There's like a dozen, there's many, many, many mechanisms mechanisms by which the genome can be modified. So they think like, oh, one base chain. No, that's that happens. And then also all these, and then epigenetics, and then all, you know, like there's so many things happening and they're all happening simultaneously, <laughs> right? So that's uh but they need oh. point mutation natural selection so that they can call it darwinian so that they can call it darwinism so that they can liken it to the utterances of a prophet right they have to limit it to- last point i want to raise and then i'll give it to the panel for everybody to sort of give their um uh, final uh, thoughts on the um on, on today's uh, conversation is um there, there isn't a conversation complete without uh, people talking about evolution having to answer questions about a, a biogenesis because these two are always conflated forever. Um, even the, 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 the Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, are always misunderstood to, to, to be to mean that that's the origin of life. Um, but is there is there a connection? And I, I and this is probably uh, one of Dave's uh, strongest points. And you know because there's a lot of chemistry going here. We're talking about and Charles Darwin. Kind of, he said, if I have to guess, it had to be in a bubbling, muddy area where there's like a thermal uh, sort of a primordial soup brewing that ends up with, with life. Do you, do you think this is still that hypothesis um, of, of biogenesis? Is this still the most plausible? I, I think the hot spring model is currently winning. I mean, it's not, uh, people are still looking at things in hydrothermal vents and like metabolism first. And like, I mean, you know, we don't know exactly what happened, obviously, but uh, I think the hot spring model has, has, has a lot going for it um, because you can have things like wet, dry cycling. Uh, you can have a smaller uh, volume with which reactions can occur. Um, and then also we're finding all these uh, different minerals, borate minerals, different kinds of minerals upon which uh, you can not only catalyze uh, uh, certain biomolecule formation, but then also polymerization. Uh, so that can even be one pot where you get, say, the nucleotides and then the RNA. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I still am far from an expert on it. I know way more than I did uh, a couple years ago, of course. But, um, yeah, I'm still reading and learning. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, re- with regards to evolution and conflating a biogenesis with, with evolution, I've actually had to backpedal on that because I, I now, where I am now, realize how much chemical evolution is actually a thing. And that selection does yeah. a, did occur on the molecular level and where you have uh, competing uh, ribozymes, um, where you have autocatalysis happening and you have systems of molecules that are in competition for resources and certain sequences of RNA uh, win over others. Um, and that's how you eventually get peptides and then you have these little systems of molecules evolving for millions of years until you finally get to a system that resembles what we would call life that would have metabolic properties and be able to uh, completely replicate and everything like that. So that's one of the mega, mega straw man, straw men 
uh, that that they all push even tour. You know, why can't you uh, make it happen in a lab? Right. I'll give you all the pieces. And why can't you just go like this, like their little Legos and make us because nature also didn't do that. Right. They creationists think that scientists suggest that you had some molecules in a pond and they just went like this and boom, it was life. And that is very, very not what happened. So, you know, uh, so yeah. my own mother uh, got an argument with me about you. Know, she might, my 80 year old mom was arguing, of course, that she's a creationist and I, I'm trying to tell her that I can prove evolution and she gets angry at me and she goes to her church and her church says that it's okay to believe in evolution. That's what she needed. The authoritarian declaration that it was okay <laughs> for her to believe in evolution. So she then comes home and tells me, or she comes over here and tells me that she believes in evolution now. What is it? And my thought is, how do you, how can you believe in something when you don't know what it is? And then I asked her, because she's just saying that because somebody told her she can believe in it. So she's going to believe in it, whatever the fuck it is. She's going to believe in it. Cause she was told by the authoritarian that she's going to believe in it. And I said, okay, well, why, why don't you tell me what you think it is? And I'll jump in when I see a problem, which of course I should have just admitted that or re realized that it was going to be a problem instantly. And she said, so she, she thought that evolution was where a bunch of molecules get together and make a fish and a bunch of other molecules get together to make a man. Wait, that sounds like James Tour. Well, Tour, Tour yeah. says a lizard. He likes a a slithering. Lizard. I think he likes slithering because it sounds like a snake, like from the from the bad snake from the Adam and Eve myth, right? Evil, evil snake. Yeah, slithering. Um, yeah, yeah, lightning. Yeah, and absolutely no concept of taxonomy at all. I'm like, <laughs> didn't you see the old posters? Rudy Zellinger's March of Progress. I know we don't uh. we don't use that anymore, but you've seen the poster, right? <laughs> So, so at what point was there a group of molecules that randomly, again, it's the, it's the dice roll. There's not any concept of processes involved in this. It's just a dice roll. Yeah. A bunch of molecules came together. Well, I can forgive people for not understanding the intricacies of systems chemistry. That's very abstract. Uh, you know, with the, the basic stuff you learn in ninth grade, we should all, we should all probably know that, but, um, yeah, that's the thing is that all of this is complicated. It, it, it takes time to understand. It takes discipline. And uh, when you are ideologically uh, opposed to understanding it, there's no way in hell it's ever going to happen. So I got to throw in one other thing, because you mentioned which model is the most likely um, from what little I know, because this is not anywhere near my field either. But from what I've been able to ascertain, there are a number, a number of different chemical environments for different stages of what appears to be a sequence of unrelated processes that cumulatively result in life. But what creationists want is where you bring them a plastic baggie full of chemicals in powder form and add water in a blender to make a frog. <laughs> No, you have to strike it with lightning too. You forgot about that. <laughs> oh, that's it's incredible. Do you still think the RNA? I mean, RNA explains a lot. It, it's a it's less complex. The the RNA um, it does not need the protein because I think it does act as a, also a protein um, for the functions of the cell. So, do you think the RNA hypothesis is still a strong one as a precursor for DNA for the double helix? RNA, the, the RNA first hypothesis works because RNA is autocatalytic. There are a number of ways in which RNA can make itself or other chemical environments can produce RNA. And then RNA has the capacity to also create DNA. Right, right. Uh, looks like we might have lost Dave. Hopefully he'll come back soon for his finishing um um, well, the way he's he blinked out right there at the end, he just might have phased out of existence. I'm not sure. It was too uh, much for him. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Erica? RNA, you reckon, is still a, a, a strong? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've gone back and forth. From what I understand, there are still some really strong points. Like, it's not like RNA world has been booted or, you know, as we were discussing earlier, falsified, right? I mean, I, I think it's more that there's more diversity in the field now as far as potential models that might have a good point to make. 
Um, so, you know, and, and again, like I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you like abiogenesis is, is not my forte. It's not my field. So, you know, I tend to, to hear what, what folks are saying about it and say, yeah, I mean, you know what, they're, they're making good points. It seems reasonable to me what, what they're saying now. Um, and we'll, we'll see where we continue to go with all of that. You know, I'm, I'm being noncommittal on purpose. If you can, I have lots of the, uh, respect for for um, expertise and and specialization, and, and this is not something that you get from the faithful. Because if you're a faithful person, you, you you're an expert on all subjects, and you can talk about anything. But uh, the more you're actually educated, you kind of refrain from embarrassing yourself by trying to show that you know something that you don't know or you haven't read about before and you say look you know give me give me a chance i'll read about it and i'll get educated on it and I'll, then i'll be comfortable talking about it and that's <laughs> quite respectable stance but <laughs> theology is entirely different faith is often defined as you know professing to know things you don't know <laughs> i i think you know i mean god like the truly really and truly the more you know about something the more you realize that you don't know at all, right? And that's that's simultaneously humbling and exciting. I think that's why it's fun to learn, right? Like I love, I love when I stumble across a concept and I'm like, oh wow, I don't know a single thing about this. Like, let's dive in. Let's see you know, what's, it's exciting. what's going on there. It's exciting. Yeah, it is, it is, you know, and I it, there's nothing more thrilling, you know, to me than talking to someone who really knows what they're talking about about their given thing and just letting them go, you know, they'll, yes, they'll really yeah. the, 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 of, uh, of uh, Socrates and Plato and polymath where you are jack of all trades is kind of over. You know, people are now specialized in very, very intricate um, bits and pieces of the over specialization. So I think this is this is for the better. Yeah, well, it'd if be nice. You're pale, yeah, if you're time. a paleontologist, if you're a if you're a paleoclimatologist, you're a paleoprimatologist, whatever, you're an anthropologist, you have you have the ability to prove your point in these specific fields. But if you have a, a doctorate in theology, you you basically are a PhD in Mother Goose. You, you don't know <laughs> fucking anything. <laughs> yeah, well, the cosmological arguments. <laughs> I, I, I've heard some, well, I guess, I don't know if they're theologians. I've heard some really interesting, like, I've actually learned quite a bit, you know, about people who study, you know, these, these ancient texts, whether or not it's like in Christianity or not. But I really like hearing them talk about the context that the text was written. Like, why might people have interpreted the world around them this way? That's super interesting. But as far as like, the text itself, it's not really my speed, you know, more power to them, but not my speed. Right. I'm not quite sure what happened to Dave. I'm, I've tried to email him the link again, just in case, but it might have had an, an accident or maybe an interruption in power or something we, we don't really know. I'm going to cite Act of God. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> finally, he finally shot sure. him, or, or a James Tour hired assassin. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to take now your, your final comments on, on, the, on the whole conversation today. Mainly, it's Darwin Day, um, a man who started the whole thing. Uh, he would be in school today learning more about his own theory that he started because it's, 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 a, it's quite complex now. Uh, and yeah, I'd like to hear from you, Erica, first, and then we'll go to Aram. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite telling that it's it's a Darwin Day presentation, and we spent quite a bit talking about you know how this idea that is so it's such a simple and and you know beautiful concept is still bucked by so many people today, and the things that they say to try to avoid this one particular concept that is so threatening to them, and you know I I think. If Darwin were here today, he would be simultaneously elated at the state of things and maybe a little bit distressed <laughs> that we're still having this conversation. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that I do. I think this is an important conversation to have. There are, I mean, there was a bill proposed in Montana just last week or earlier this week talking about how they want to limit the discussion of, of science to things that are facts and not theories. Imagine saying that sentence and putting that in writing. I mean, of course, there's a dissent from, from, from the folks who, who care around there, the professors, educated people and concerned parents and things like that. But the fact remains that like such such a beautiful and cohesive idea is still facing pushback in this year, 2023. And it's important to both appreciate 
Darwin in the context of, of what an awesome idea he proposed, what, a, what an incredible impact he's had on biology, and also making sure that his idea is able to, to be taught and is able to be understood by as many people as possible because it is such an awesome jumping off point for biology and, you know, not something to be afraid of, but, but something to laud, I think. So, you know, I, I enjoyed it. It was a fun conversation. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. Um, Aaron? So Darwin proposed the two, two transitional species that he, he gave specific definitions for. And he said a number of the other things that, sh that should be lauded and applauded. I would love to be able to bring Darwin forward in time or go back in time to talk with the man to just give, give him some idea of how, how his insight has borne through and, and, and been vindicated and how it was, how it was opposed and by what people, you know, for example, uh, Mao Zedong and Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin rejected Darwinism outright fully and vehemently and it, and their rejection of Darwinian evolution resulted in the deaths of tens of millions of people. That's just not even an exaggeration. That's being completely literal. So we could explain to Darwin how the missing link was discovered a hundred years after he predicted it. We could, we could explain the corrections to a couple of things that he got wrong. Like when he talked about gemules mm -hmm. and we could, we could start to explain how genetics really work and he'd be absolutely fascinated at this. And then when we tell him why people still to this day reject it, some people reject his theory and the arguments that they use he would be befuddled and I think greatly dismayed at the evolution of humanity because there's no naturally selective force that's just eliminating stupid people. <laughs> on the contrary, on the contrary, by the looks of things. <laughs> Apparently, yes. <laughs> Politically, they seem to be gaining weight. Yeah. 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 Well, well, I mean, I'm an antinatalist and um, you know, my wife and I have been together for over 20 years and we decided not to have children and it seems to be that uh, this is going to be the Imagine curse. how many antinatalists you fulfilled their wishes of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I shudder to think at how many antinatalists went down the drain of my shower. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 That's uh, that's an that's an interesting concept to end the conversation with. Yeah, that that uh, might be that might be the finisher. It adds, <laughs> uh, that's what I call a happy ending. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, well, guys, uh, I I always enjoy the conversation with you. Thanks very much for bringing so much information and knowledge and science to the to the community um, uh, that we live in at the moment. Uh, it's an exciting time. I, I look forward to hearing more about your. Um, uh, journey with um, biology and evolution, any more findings. I know, Eric, I, 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 I follow you quite closely and Aaron as well. Um, I'm very interested in new species found, new um, uh, new arguments, new um, interesting arguments for um, the, how solid uh, the fact of evolution is. And uh, I'd like to thank you both for your contribution to science and knowledge. Yeah, I, I'll extend that to thank Erica myself. Oh, and mine, mine back to you, Aaron. Mine back to you. Thanks very much. Well, uh, on behalf of Dave, he's no longer with us, but I'd like to thank him very much for his contribution. He's done a lot, and I think he's going to continue to uh, uh, show James Tour uh, his place. And um, until the next conversation, uh, we thank you all. <laughs>